Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording has started. Cloud is rolling. Thank you. Back up, back up is rolling. Thank you. And you may start with your opening statement, Sergeant Biondo. Good, uh, good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Public Housing. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes? Once again, would all panelists please turn on their videos for ver verification purposes? And to minimize disruptions, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony.council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair and Samuel. We are ready to begin. First, apologies for the delays, everyone. This is a first for me. I'm usually right on time. So let's just get started. Good morning. I'm now calling this Public Housing Committee hearing on public safety at NYCHA to order. I am Council Member Alika Ampri Samuel, and I chair the Public Housing Committee. I am joined this morning by Public Advocate Jamani Williams, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Diaz Sr., Council Member Jonai, Council Member Lewis, and Council Member Rosenthal, thank you for being here, who chairs the subcommittee on capital budget and finance. And if I've missed anyone, forgive me and I'll make sure to recognize you after. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss safety and security in NYCHA. These are issues that have plagued NYCHA for a long time, but given how serious it is, it should be approached with urgency. One month ago, a man was arrested in connection to a series of murders at Woodson Houses, which is a senior housing development. His most recent victim, Ms. Caballero, was 78 years old. Nearly two years ago, this committee conducted a hearing on virtually the same topic, prompted by chillingly similar circumstances. The murder of 83-year-old Ms. Jacola James is not just the very, and not just the same NYCHA complex, but the very same building. And that was four years after 82-year-old Miss Myrtle McKinney was found murdered in the same building. As a result of the city, as a result, the city allocated capital specifically for safety measures that we still question today. In this hearing, I expect an update on what exactly has been done at Woodson between then and now, why was another senior killed in the same exact NYCHA complex when we already discussed security deficiencies there? Were security cameras installed and were other safety improvements made? I want to be clear today that we want to know what happened at Woodson but we also wanna know what is happening across NYCHA's portfolio. The murders at Woodson are horrific, but unsafe conditions are not unique. The purpose of having dedicated senior buildings is to increase comfort for the aging adults in our community. An unsolved murder should have been of utmost importance, yet it was allowed to multiply and become a serial occurrence. There's been an increase in violent crime across NYCHA developments during the pandemic. And I don't want to recount every single instance for you to get the picture. There's been an increase in crime across New York City in general. But just looking at NYCHA's numbers in Brooklyn alone, murders were up 92.7%. Shootings were up 84.4%. And shooting victims were up 90.7%. I say it time and time again, the priority has to be the safety and well-being of residents. If we are not putting their needs first, then NYCHA is failing, the administration is failing, and everybody involved 
is failing. We are not here to simply point fingers and call it a day. And most importantly, this is not, and this will not be a gotcha moment or an aha moment. I can assure you that I am not trying to expose a brand new scandal in NYCHA. That has been done many times over. Please don't throw facts and figures that paint a picture that things are going well because we know there are safety concerns because people are dead. Today, I just want to get to the bottom of the why and discuss real concrete solutions. We wanna know about areas for improvement, where safety and security measures have fallen short and what is needed to fix those problems, including how the city council can think about allocating much needed funds to make those improvements along with our colleagues in the state government and what we see coming in from the federal government. I look forward to hearing from NYCHA residents so we can get a clearer understanding of their safety priorities and concerns and hear from NYPD, NYCHA, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice on their efforts to prevent and reduce crime, especially violent crime across the NYCHA developments. So with that being said, I wanna kick things off by hearing first from the residents themselves. But before we do that, I wanna turn it over to our public advocate, Jamani Williams, who I think is still on the line. And then we'll hear from committee counsel Audrey Sun to go over some housekeeping matters for today's hearing. So thank you. And is the public advocate still here? Okay, I know our public advocate said he was between meetings and so doesn't look like he's available right now. So Audrey Sun. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Audrey Sun, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify. Uh, we will begin, as the chair said, with a panel of NYCHA residents. Please listen for your name to be called. When it is your turn, I will call your name and you will be unmuted. So we will now hear from the opening panel. Uh, first, we will hear from Linda James, followed by Lisa Kenner. Starting time. Hi, um, my name is Linda James, and I am the daughter of J. Colia James. Um, my mother was a resident, my grandmother was a resident first. And then my mom was a resident who was murdered on April 30th of uh, 2019. I, my mom moved into the building when my grandmother, who was aging, would often leave the building. My mom wanted to be able to know that she was safe. So she moved in to take care of her. So whenever she got missing, my mom would know because my mom was living in the building. And then when my grandmother passed, my mom was able to stay in the apartment um, because she herself was a senior. Uh, my question is, when we build senior residence specifically for seniors, are we taking those precautions to keep those seniors safe? Now we know that it's not your job to, to provide their health matters, but when you're building a senior citizen housing, there are certain circumstances that we need to be aware of, right? So as they age, Alzheimer's sets in, they can leave the building and no one would know. The day my mom was murdered, the day my mom was murdered, I spent the entire night from 12.45 until six o'clock in the morning trying to prevent another senior citizen from leaving that building because there were no cameras and, I, and a murder had just occurred. And I was afraid that he was still out there and she was trying to leave. Now, I know that she had some type of mental illness because she was using the hallway as a public bathroom and she wasn't able to communicate co comprehensively. So I know that there was an issue there, but I spent that entire night wanting to make sure she didn't leave because if she left, there was no way for her family to even know what time she even left the building if something happened to her. Time expired. 
Please, Ms. James, continue. Apologies for that. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what cautions, what precautions do we take specifically when we when we deem a residence a uh, senior citizen complex to protect them, to keep them safe? Security that doesn't ask for an ID when you go into a building, you can say I'm Barack Obama and go upstairs to apartment 5G when you actually, and say you're going to 5G when you're actually going to 5D and no one knows because you're just signing in a book if the security is there. You're signing in a book, you're not, pre you're not presenting ID. They don't double check where you're going. And sometimes they just let you go in a building without stopping you because it's not in their purview to protect you. So we leave our senior citizens like sheep surrounded by wolves. And my question is, what do we do? What, what, do we, what mandates are there for keeping these seniors safe once we designate a building as a senior residence? Thank you so much, Ms. James. Thank you so much. And at the end of the resident testimony, we will hear from the administration in NYCHA NYPD, and um, we're looking to get answers to those questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. We will now hear from Lisa Kenner, followed by Mary McGee. Starting time. Good morning. My name is Lisa Kenner and I was born and raised at Van Dyke Houses. I'm also the resident association president here. I am testifying concerning the dangerous conditions of the development that affect the residents' quality of life, health, and safety. First of all, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice brought in the Mayor's Action Plan at 15 housing development throughout New York City housing which was supposed to work with the resident association, not against. Instead of dividing residents, it was supposed to help bring more unity in the community. Yes, we received new bright lights, new front doors, and intercoms was installed. However, the lights are brighter, but the intercoms are still not working in some buildings going over five years. I have heard numerous excuses from NYCHA, safety and security department to the mayor's office of criminal justice, which is that mayor's action plan. However, July the 1st, 2020, 143 men moved into the old helping hands on Powell Street. And I have gone to numerous meetings concerning the unsafe conditions and still everybody's dragging their feet. This is why the lobby windows or the front door glass are getting vandalized because the intercoms are not working and people want to get in the building. However, with the new building, Van Dyke 3, it's almost completed. I have sat down with Trinity Finance from day one. They are decent human beings. However, during these meetings, I asked them, will they wash the windows of the resident that live at 429 and 393 Dumont Avenue after they complete 405 Dumont Avenue. Time expired. Due to the overwhelming dirt and dust that has landed on these residents' windows, they agreed to get them washed. However, as I was told by NYCHA Development Department recently that it can't be done as per NYCHA Capital. No, I don't understand why. NYCHA is not going to pay for it. Therefore, this is a safe and health condition to every resident that live in these two buildings. When they open up their window, the dust and the dirt fill their apartment, and some of them suffer from numerous illness. However, we deserve respect. Yes, I know we are in the pandemic and our family safety and health matters. So under the 964, and 964 regulation, 964.117, before any agency comes into our development, they have to have some respect. You just can't come in there and think you're just gonna take over. It's about showing respect. So I thank you, 
council member from hearing me. And I'm not gonna stop until those people windows get washed after that new building get up here because that's a health hazard. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Mary McGee followed by Beverly McFarland. Starting time. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having this meeting. I think this is a very important and sensitive subject. On March 21st at 1248 PM, 2020, my daughter was coming in the elevator when she got on my floor, a man grabbed her and covered her mouth and dragged in the stairs. Thank God, she's a fighter. She was able to scream, I heard her, myself and one neighbor, one neighbor came out. He dragged her from the 13th floor to the 12th floor. I saw my daughter fighting for her life. I grabbed the man, my neighbor grabbed his other side. This man was so strong. He dragged us down two flights of stairs to the 10th floor where I finally got a hold of him. And I just started punching him and punching him and punching him until he got loose, but I ended up with all his top layer clothes, his backpack with all his personal information and his lunch. This is in the afternoon. And it's just insane that nature has not once, social services never reached out to me or my daughter. Nature has done nothing Nothing, nothing, nothing to help me, but give me false hopes on, on things. But the people that should have contacted me have not to this day contacted me or my daughter to see how we're doing. I know that incident happened to my daughter, but it's so traumatic to me because I relive it. I'm still in the same apartment. I'm still going outside to throw out my garbage with the weapon in my hand because we have so many homeless people in our buildings that the other day, two days ago, um, I, I came out the elevator and this homeless man came out the stairs and I'm like, I just Time jumped back and he ran in the elevator. And our buildings, we never had this issue the way we are having it now. Our buildings lobbies are not locked. The majority are unlocked. I don't understand why I put in ticket after ticket. Um, I know other residents have done the same, but nothing is being done to keep us safe. Two days ago, a teenage boy was beaten up and dragged in our development at three o'clock in the afternoon. We shouldn't be living in fear. We, sh we have the rights to quality of life and safety. NYCHA needs to do more for its residents. I don't care how much funding you say you don't have, but we as residents pay our rents and we have rights. You need to do more. You need to ensure that our doors are fixed. What, what's the sense of having a lobby door if it's unlocked? What is the sense of me paying rent when I don't feel safe? I don't come out after dark. If it's dark, and even though these incidents happen in the daytime, but I don't even, I don't even wanna know what happens once it gets dark outside. I've reached out to my elected officials for help. Um, none have helped me, none, none, none. I reached outside of my district and I guess that person was told not to help me either. They referred me back to my elected official. If residents don't have the security of being able to turn to their politicians, the people that are supposed to advocate on their behalf, then where do they turn? Who can they go to? Nation needs to be held responsible for what happened. Look at that, that mother in Harlem where her son, all, night, all they did was give her a panic button and they still killed her. My heart breaks for that family. My heart breaks for every family that is a victim of crime or has lost somebody. And I just hope this panel and this meeting is going to make that change and that difference and let NYCHA residents know they matter. I thank you for your time 
and appreciate you all. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Beverly McFarland, followed by Miguel Acevedo. Start in time. Excuse me, Miss Beverly, uh, you are unmuted, but we don't have any audio coming out. Ms. McFarland, did you join with your computer audio? Okay, let me just jump in there real quick um, and recognize that we have also been joined by Council Member Salamanca, Council Member Menchaca, Council Member Riley, Council Member Barron, as well as Council Member Adams. And thank you so much, Council Member Adams, for joining us as you're the chair of the Public Safety Committee. So I really appreciate that. Oh, and Council Member Gibson. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. McFarland, we'll return to you once we're able to sort out the uh, audio issue. Uh, in the meantime, we'll hear from Miguel Acevedo, followed by Maria Forbes. Starting time. Hi, everyone. I'm Miguel Acevedo, TA President of Robert Fulton Housings. I have never seen so many homeless people living in public housing developments. We met with the captain of PSA 4 the other day, and the biggest issue that every single TA president had with the homeless population was literally living in our developments. Just yesterday, I received a ring video from one of my residents showing a homeless person making every attempt to get into the apartments. He was turning all the doorknobs. Just like Mary just said earlier, it's a situation that has to be rectified because before somebody dies in one of these buildings, it's going to be too late. You know, they, they come in and it's like they live there. The police are removing them, but you arrest them on Monday or remove them on Tuesday, they're back. They are so comfortable in these developments. And I understand because they feel secured for some reason in our development, but it still is a real bad safety issue that has to be addressed right away. There's no way that we could continue to hear that it's a mental health issue and the police department as they do their job to remove these individuals, but then in their back in the street, there's got to be something done I don't want to wait till one of my residents gets killed by these homeless individuals. They're there every single day. And I would please and appreciate that something gets done today, not sometime next week when I lose a resident. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Maria Forbes, followed by Crystal Glover. Starting time. Hi. 
Hello, how are you? Maria Forbes from Clay Avenue Tennis Association. Um, Claremont Consolidated, just one moment, they're gonna get that background noise out the area for me, but Claremont Consolidated consists of seven tenant association presidents, 750 units. Um, we're not a conventional development. We stand like individual private buildings. And our concern with security, correct me if I'm right or wrong, is that from the beginning of the pandemic and even before, you know, security has been a great issue to all of us, that the mass, I had to contact the commissioner, Che, the very beginning mass became mandatory. Even to have cameras in my center distributing food became a great concern and fear because why wow, some people were robbing, mugging, whatever was going on. And you see how crime has just taken its toll on us that that's not really being addressed with NCOs. Like we can't get regular vertical patrol for, for this particular development. And I'll say that because they're covering 28 walk-ups and then another conventional development north of us, no, south of us. So how can just the two assigned NCOs cover such a great area and then go back and do whatever patrolling that they have to do to the high rise areas. But I wanna say that my Commanding officer has worked with us very well. I have another building that falls under PSA. And I just was with the um, chief Monday night at an event. And I just want to say that 1162 Washington Avenue is a great concern of us because that building is an elevated building, 90 units with, I'm expired. with four different stair halls. So I said to the PSA, I said, you need to send in at least a team of six officers to that building alone because of the seven different exits, exits to that building. But this mass and no police coverage, it's like we lost everything from sanitation to repairs to everything on top of police coverage. And that's very important to us as public housing residents that we get that issue addressed and having more police coverage to these developments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We will now hear from Crystal Glover and then we will return to uh, Beverly McFarland. Starting time. Good day to the Committee on Public Housing Thank you for having this hearing on public safety at NYCHA. There are 397 developments in New York. So when I get an invitation to these hearings, I come. My name is Crystal Glover and I'm a resident at Washington Houses, a former TA president. Many residents watch this program. So when I get an invitation to come, I come so that if I, if I can say something that a resident can hear and it can help them to grow, because it's about growth. We come to these, these meetings and things still stay the same. These uh, public hearings, no disrespect to anyone in this committee, but nothing changes. But thankfully, people do watch the city council channel, so hopefully they'll hear something today. Um, public safety at NYCHA is not just a matter of drug sales, robberies, and rape, but it's also a matter of health safety. Coronavirus has devastated our country. Cigarette smoking is a major problem here. I want to first say, contrary to what people may think, NYCHA families are sweet, decent, wholesome people. Residents have been smoking cigarettes in public housing for over 60 years. Some smoke them because they enjoy smoking. Others are just addicted. Now with NYCHA's smoke-free policy, smokers feel they are being singled out and picked on. Nobody complains about the reefer smoke, they say, 
But did you know that some of the same chemicals in reefer is in cigarettes? So why wasn't reefer, why wasn't reefer put in the smoke free policy? Good question. Reefer is not legal. It's still illegal in New York State. But back to cigarettes. Residents are told smoking cigarettes 25 feet outside of the building. This does not mean outside of your window because the air just pushes it back into the building. Now, do you think residents are going to dress their families to go outside every time they want to smoke a cigarette? Even a single person may not take the time out to do that. Then it's the issue of residents' guests. Guests don't pay rent in our building. They're visiting. So they smoke. Their smoking is an invasion of residents' privacy. I don't want to believe that cigarette smokers don't care about their neighbors. So what should we do? Think about this. Some neighbors have illnesses like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and respiratory illnesses. They should not be inhaling smoke. Children, nobody should be breathing in secondhand and thirdhand smoke. The thirdhand smoke is the ash. So what are residents forced to do? They can choose to sit there, get sick and die, or they can call the centralized call center 718-707-7771 and put in a ticket. This is the only system NYCHA have to address this issue. So you call and tell them that Betty Lou in 7B is smoking you out of house and home. You know where the smoke is coming from, especially if you've been living there long enough. You don't have to approach your neighbor. The property manager has to keep record of these complaints, which is good for you because that is proof that you have been complaining and you're not satisfied. Because of the, we are breathing in stale air that's contaminated with a little bit of everything. This is just food for thought. The smoke-free policy is a public safety issue because if a resident gets fed up and approaches a resident about their smoking, the neighbor can get mad and come out shooting. I was told by the director of the NYCHA smoke-free policy that HUD did not put enough money into the policy to secure the elimination of smoking in NYCHA buildings altogether. He said NYCHA put the policy out there and I quote, left them in the dark. Even brief exposure to secondhand smoke can damage the lining of blood vessels and cause your blood platelets to become stickier. This changes, these changes can cause a deadly heart attack. NYCHA, the smoke-free policy, I will not sit back and die from the poisonous chemicals of cigarette smoke. Any resident that wants to work with me can contact me at G Crystal, that's with a C, R Y S T A L, 2234 at gmail.com. This is a question that I want to put forth in the event that none of y'all are going to ask me a question. And the question is Have I contacted NYCHA about the smoke free policy? I've spoken with the director for the smoke free policy. I was even on the panel back in 2017 because I had been complaining about the smoke and they told me they were putting the panel together and I got on the panel. They have hired eight liaisons to work 397 developments. Um, and I just wanted to say, just thank you. Um, community affairs, if you want to work with us, I don't know, with 390 something developments, um, I don't understand why there's so few um, resident leaders here. Um, I know I'm one of the best, and I can't do it all. I mean, that's just a little something, something. But when Victor Bach, I'm going to say this one last thing. When Victor Bach invites me, because I'm on his mailing list for his organization, when he invites me, I come out and I participate. I don't know if my resident association knows about these meetings. I don't know if Manhattan South um, which is supposedly the largest district, um, if they even know about it. But I thank you, Amphrey Samuels, for allowing me to speak. 
Um, I also wanted to say hi, Andre Ward. I watch your program with the Forces Society. You'll do very good work. To Linda James, I am so sorry that this had to happen to your mother. And the police department, y'all have to work with us. Management is asleep. Somebody is sleeping at the wheel. And guess what? We're all on welfare. Because anytime you're getting, the difference is y'all getting good money and the welfare recipients are getting pennies. You're not doing your jobs. You're not getting paid to do nothing. I remember calling the precinct one time, last thing. I remember calling the precinct when the youth took over our stoop. We couldn't even get in our building with the candles and the Hennessy bottles. And they uh, the, and they up and up they dead uh, 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 brother who was shot in the brains. And I called the precinct, and guess what the cop told me? He said the politicians gave the okay and not management. And on that note, I'm out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Beverly McFarland. And after that, we will hear from the administration. Starting time. Yeah, I still don't hear you, uh, Beverly. Uh, apologies, Ms. McFarland. We'll hear from the administration, and after we receive their testimony, we'll return to you to receive your testimony. One second. Um, did the public advocate join us? Uh, no, I just received word from his staff that uh, he had to um, move to a different meeting and is not okay. able to join. Okay, I want to just double check. Thank you. But he will be submitting his testimony, his written testimony for the record. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to testimony from the administration. A uh, brief reminder to council members to please use the Zoom raise hand function if you would like to ask any questions, and I will call on you in turn. Uh, after the administration, we will hear from the remaining members of the public. I will now administer the oath which, to the administration, which is represented by Marco Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Chief David Barrer and Michael Clark from NYPD, and Chief Gerald Nelson and Stephen Lovesey from NYCHA. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Marco, Marco Soler? Yes, I do. Chief David Barrer? I do. Michael Clark? I do. Chief Gerald Nelson? I do. And Stephen Lovesey? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Amber Samuel, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Council. I'm David Boyer, Chief of Housing Bureau of New York City Police Department. I'm joined today by Gerald Nelson, Vice President for Public Safety for the New York City Housing Authority, Marco Soler, Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and Michael Clark, Management Attorney of the NYPD's Legislative Affairs Unit. On behalf of Commissioner Dermot Shea, I wish to thank the Council for the opportunity to discuss these important issues. The core of the NYPD's mission is to ensure that each and every resident in each and every neighborhood in our city can be able to walk out of their front door without having to fear for their safety. 400,000 residents of New York City public housing developments are no less deserving of this freedom from fear, and the department has been committed to providing the highest level of service to these residential communities. The NYPD has never wavered from this commitment, even during the unprecedented challenges that the past 12 months have imposed on our city and on the NYPD. 
This has been a challenging year, facing a multi levered crisis, a crisis that every New Yorker has been helping each other through. It is this spirit of community and collaboration that inspires us at the NYPD to continue to strive to do better. The departments, and specifically the Housing Bureau's commitment to neighborhood policing and housing has reaped numerous benefits, not just in solving crimes, but also in reinforcing our overall commitment to the bettering of quality of life for NYCHA residents. Our partners at Cure Violence are working with us in our developments. Violence interrupters have deep inroads in their communities and groups such as 696 Build Queensbridge have been instrumental in changing individual and community attitudes and norms about gun violence. The NYPD is also funding a $4 million basketball court initiative in partnership with NYCHA. It's to rebuild or refurbish arena style basketball courts capable of being converted to soccer fields in over a dozen locations from about 60 sites that we've already uh, surveyed. Work is scheduled to begin this spring with the goal that all construction will be completed by the fall with many ready for use much sooner than that. Unfortunately, even while our city is beset by historic challenges, we have also experienced a saddening rise in shootings and homicides. I think each of these tragedies personally, and even one shooting is one too many with me. NYCHA residents have not been spared from the citywide uptick. The proportion of on-development shooting has stayed consistent for the last 19 years, including last year. As soon as we saw the increase in shootings, the Housing and Patrol Services Bureaus redoubled our efforts to stem the tide. It is exactly these types of scenarios which the precision policing model is designed for, allowing us to quickly redeploy personnel and resources to the affected areas and enabling our detective squads to more effectively investigate and arrest those relatively small number of individuals who account for the majority of the city's violent crime. We are all doing this while maintaining the downward trend of summonses issued and other low level enforcement to historic low levels. Our partnership with NYCHA is the most important facet in our combined efforts to keep every resident in public housing safe. I and my staff maintain ongoing daily communications with Chief Nelson and other NYCHA executives, as did each of my predecessors in the role of Chief of Housing. I personally do walkthroughs of developments with my partner at NYCHA, General Manager Vito Musichulo. My commanders as well partner with the local NYCHA managers to problem solve at the development level. This collaboration is key not only to focused effective policing, it is the backbone of neighborhood policing and our developments. Each PSA is fully staffed with their complement of neighborhood coordination officers who continue these collaborative efforts with the NYCHA staff and of course our residents. Our public housing residents are often the backbone of the neighborhoods where they reside. And, and just like they are for their, they're for each other, we in the NYPD are there for them forever and whenever needed. And I'd be happy to answer any questions Madam Chair or any other member of the council have. Thank you so much, Chief Barrea. I really appreciate your testimony today. And just to be clear to everyone, um, the only testimony that would be read this morning, well, this afternoon, is from Chief Barrea. But everyone, the administration and NYCHA are all prepared to answer questions now. And we have been joined by Council Member Van Bramer as well. So with that, can you provide us an update on the number of shootings, murders, and major crimes that occurred at NYCHA in 2019 and 2020. And how many shootings, murders, and major crimes occurred at MAP sites in 2019 and 2020? And with that question, it's, it's also about you know, just comparing the crimes at MAP sites and the crimes at non-MAP sites for the same time frame, 2019, 2020. Okay, so uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the question. Last year, um, the, the Housing Authority, uh, we experienced a, a slight uptick 
the overall uh, index crime, meaning our seven major crime categories of murder, rape, robbery, felony, assault, burglary, grand larceny, and grand larceny auto. Um, that was primarily being driven by shooting incidents, as you pointed out in, in, uh, in your opening statement. Last year, um, we sort of, that, that crime was primarily driven by our shooting incidents. We were up, sadly, 105% in shooting incidents, where last year we had a total of 318 shooting incidents within housing authority campuses. Um, when we look uh, at what, in fact, was driving those shooting incidents last year, uh, about two thirds of them, 66% of those were being driven by gang violence. Um, sadly enough, it was uh, primarily uh, shootings that were occurring in, in, the, uh, in the evening hours for the most part. When we look um, at our individual boroughs, um, all of our boroughs in New York City um, experienced increases uh, in shooting incidents. Uh, when we look at our map developments, when we look at our map developments for 2020, um, we saw a 4% uh, increase in crime uh, last year in our overall map developments. Where in 2019, we saw a 4% decrease. However, I want to um, just point out, Madam Chair, that since the beginning, of the MAP program, which I am a big uh, fan of, um, we've seen uh, significant reductions. We've seen a total of 8% um, reduction uh, in 2015, a 9% reduction in uh, 2017. And so overall about a 3% overall reduction in our MAP developments, which kind of bucks the overall trend that we saw um, during the same time, time period uh, in, in the other housing developments. I know a lot of, you had a lot of questions. I, I hope I, I answered them all. <laughs> that was um, very helpful. Um, you mentioned the 66% 66, 66 um, drive by gang violence, yes, um, increase by gang violence. Um, just from your expertise and what you've been able to analyze, um, what's the cause of the gang violence that you saw um, during 2020? And um, did social media at all play a role in the spike? And did you see any like issues with social media? Yeah, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in terms of our gang violence, it was, that, that's the, let me start by saying about two thirds of them, I can tell you are gang related shootings. What, in my expert opinion, it's higher than that. Um, the, the way we identify a gang member a lot of times is they self-identify as a gang member to us. They, 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 they will tell us they're gang members. You mentioned social media. Um, we see on social media, a lot of times they're identified by what they're posting, what they're proud to post, they're, you know, whether it's gang signs or, or self-identification, once again, um, with being a gang member. What was very unique, and I don't have to tell any members of the distinguished council um, was clearly COVID. You know, COVID. Let's let's start right there. Um, you know, other places in New York City shut down. Let, let, you know, we know our transit system was shutting down four hours a night. We know our commercial uh, districts were shut down. Um, you know, our stadiums, theaters, restaurants, in public housing. Um, we, we, didn't, we, we did not shut down, quite the opposite. Um, our residents uh, were all at home, many of them working from home. Um, and it was very difficult, very difficult for the, the residents of public housing. And, um, you know, our Cornerstone program, for instance, this summer, our Cornerstone, whoever named it, it wasn't me, just an incredible name. We have 120 sites citywide. Um, that allow our, their safe areas, community centers for our children to be able to hang out from early in the morning to late at night where we have police officers covered. Those sites were, were closed. Kids need a place to hang out. I think, you know, I was a kid a long time ago, but I was a kid, we hung out. And um, it was this, you know, 
we, we put, a, you know, all, all youth, in, but especially in public housing, the youth, you know, that cornerstone um, was taken away in the summer. Um, the community centers, we, we, the basketball courts were closed, our playgrounds were closed, uh, PAL centers, and um, coupled with the, uh, you know, the, the immediate shutdown of our court systems. And I, I'm not here to point the finger at anybody because, um, you know, when you look at it, that was a difficult decision to be made. And I can argue that it would be highly irresponsible to bring a grand jury together and have 46 members, especially of our vulnerable po populations, sitting in a, in a tight courtroom where law mandates that a grand jury has to be done in person. So with this, um, we, we, were, we had several cases of um, where we had long-term cases, conspiracy cases that we were working against our gang members, not only with our local federal, uh, with our local partners in, in, in our five counties, but also with our federal partners, our federal prosecutors. And they really came to a halt because for several months, um, we had no grand jury sitting and we were unable to move forward with prosecutions. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Madam Chair, you mentioned social media and I wish I had the social media in front of me, but we had gang members actually communicating with, with each other saying that the courts are closed, the police can't do anything. So it almost gave them um, a, uh, I don't wanna say a, you know, they, they, I felt that they, they believed that they could act with impunity. And um, I, I also think that when children, uh, we're seeing gang recruitment at a much younger age than we've seen uh, prior, very young age. And that coupled with um, not being able to provide our children with places that they normally, the safe spaces, if you will, in public housing um, that, they, that they was able to go to, I think, you know, coupled with everything, I think that that added to uh, um, our gang violence. And, and yes, you know, just to um, interject there, can you give us the average age? What's the age range that you're talking about here? I don't have, you know, I don't have these statistics, but I'm going to just say right off the bat, they're recruiting kids younger than 12 years old now. I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking as that sounds. Um, they're, you know, at high school, um, I, I don't know, I'm an optimist, so I never want to say it's too late, but we, we have to get to these children at a much younger age, you know, and, and um, you, our youth strategy right now um, we've just this year, we're really excited about it. Citywide, we've rolled out our youth uh, coordination officers, um, our, which is, we call them our YCOs. And they're really, our, our YCOs now are working with our neighborhood coordination officers. And our YCOs, um, they're just like our NCOs, are assigned to the same geographical areas, so the same developments. And their job is really to deal with um, all children under the age of 18 who live within the developments. And not only when they come into negative contact with the police, but children who may have gone missing, um, children who are not going to school, following up with parents, working with the neighborhood coordination officers in conjunction to try to make sure that we're, we're getting to these youth at these very young ages, mentoring, um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned in my opening statement um, the four million dollars that um, that we're, we're we're putting into New York City basketball courts. I'm really excited about that because um, that four million dollars, and I want to thank Commissioner Chauncey Parker um, here with the NYPD. That was forfeiture money that was earmarked for the Housing Bureau. Normally, we would spend that money on overtime for police officers or equipment, cars, things to that uh, nature. This year we're taking a different approach to, to, um, to support our YCOs we're on the ground right now with our, with our children. Um, we're building these really, they're beautiful, Madam Chair, they are beautiful basketball courts, high-end basketball courts, anywhere from 250,000 to $300,000 um, each. And, you know, they can be converted to soccer um, easily convert to soccer fields also, which is pretty wild. And um, now we're giving them a, another safe space 
that for the last year, I'm going to argue our children didn't have. Our children, and this is, I get it, this is a statewide, a nationwide crisis. And, and um, but, you know, right now, I think my argument is the, the children in public housing um, really had nowhere to go. They, they, didn't, they didn't have uh, as many options as, as people that, that live in a less urban environment. Thank you so much, Chief Herrera, for that information about the YCOs and the money that's being spent. Um, and so that'll be helpful for us with later questioning. Um, I wanna go next to questions about, is there an increase in crime at sites with stalled scaffolding, with installed scaffolding? And please provide us with an update on the removal of non-essential scaffolding um, and sidewalk sheds. That you're directing that, that was, that's not directed at me, Madam Chair, is it? Sidewalk sheds? No, this is directed at, um, this will be directed at NYCHA. Thank you. And if you want to chime in around scaffolding and crime, that's that's okay. Yes, but I'm sure Steve or someone will be able to answer this question. And just for my colleagues, um, I'll end there so because I know that my colleagues have some specific questions that are also on my list of questioning, but I'll allow my colleagues to, to go first. So sidewalk sheds, scaffolding, crime. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This is Stephen Lovesey with Capital Projects Division. Um, I, I don't have the statistics on crime uh, regarding uh, crime at sidewalk sheds. Um, as we talk about uh, capital projects, particularly the sidewalk sheds or the safety sheds for construction projects, um, we're constantly removing sheds um, and um, you know, as we have uh, continued to move, the estimated number of sidewalk sheds to date right now is 213,624 linear sheds. And as we move projects uh, in the capital portfolio, that number drops in the, uh, the capital projects. Um, unfortunately, as uh, we have discussed and, and with many council members, the local law 11 or the facade program uh, that those sheds tend to continue to rise. Okay, I think it would be helpful to um, get a sense of where this, the sheds are, where the scaffoldings are um, located, and then compare that to the um, crime data and crime stats in that same area. Because, of course, we hear complaints from residents that those scaffolds um, increase the, the um, the you know, issues with visibility and lighting issues, and um, there could be a direct um, correlation to crime in that immediate area um, under the sheds, right? And so because that's something that I know I constantly hear complaints from constituents and residents, it just seemed like something that we would be tracking. And I'm, we're doing the same as we, as I go out and visit with tenant leaders as well as residents, um, as we know that there is a lot of capital happening uh, in our developments. Um, the capital is good on the safety protection, uh, as you said, provides areas in which uh, feel uncomfortable to the residents. I know that we work regularly with our contractors uh, to make sure that they are well lit and we try to keep as much visibility as possible obviously uh, complying with the DOB codes associated to that, um, which do put limitations on uh, where we put them, uh, the netting that we have to put in there, the, the color of the netting, the color of the, of the sheds. And so, um, but again, we're constantly working in ways in which we can decrease that. Uh, we had, did work with the Department of Buildings uh, on, a, on a pattern in which we use fencing more than we use sheds. And that allowed us to have more transparency and openness. Um, but again, we definitely recognize that these sheds create a scenario in which uh, residents are definitely uncomfortable and it creates a possibility for, uh, for um, criminal activity to happen. Thank you. And I know um, Chief Nelson, you remember that I'm sure quite well from your days 
um, in the community. Um, but also Chief Ferrer, I think when you are doing your, your, your walks and tours with, with Vito Mustachulo, it would be helpful to kind of, you know, have a lens um, when you're doing those, those walks to look at the scaffolding, you know, with the actual lens of safety and security, because this is a, an ongoing concern and complaint and it's great to be able to have conversations with DOB about placement um, and you know, just policy. But when we're talking about safety and security, it's good to have input um, from NYPD and the residents during those walks. Because the same way the residents will point out where cameras should be located, I think um, the residents are well capable and, and should be able to walk around with PD and NYCHA to discuss you know, safety and security as it relates to scaffolding and um, sidewalk sheds. Chief Nelson? Yes, if I may, uh, the shedding as it pertains to the cameras, you're right, the residents are uh, all very helpful um, whenever there's new shedding put up because the closed circuit TV units under my purview, we would have to send somebody out to make sure that the cameras are not actually being blocked. We have the NYPD at some time an uh, NCO may call my unit and say, you know, the new shedding, we have issues with uh, where the camera is. So we'll send a team out to try and to make the adjustment so that those cameras will not be blocked in the event. The sheddings are a big thing. We all take the tours and we had a development where there's a lot of shedding. Those are some of the major complaints. Okay, thank you. Um, Audrey, I'm gonna end my questioning there um, so that my colleagues are, are able to jump in and then I'll go back to you. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I'll now call on council members in order to ask questions. Um, we will begin with council member Ayala followed by council member Barron. Starting time. Thank you. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to begin quite frankly. Um, I have, you know, since last year and I know we had this conversation the last time that we had a similar hearing about the conditions in the developments in my district. Uh, Council member uh, Samuel and I are kind of like twin sister districts in that we have the, 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 the most uh, public housing of most of the members on this body. And so we, we're seeing a lot of things that maybe some of our colleagues are not. And it's really frustrating for me as an elected official to continue to see these things happening and not be able to provide the relief that is necessary. And I think that that's for a million different types of reasons. Um, I have had seniors that have been robbed in their own homes in senior buildings. I have had multiple shootings in the last couple of months in lobbies at Mott Haven, uh, Millbrook, Mitchell. Um, I have in East Harlem alone, this is a, this is just, this is a, like, I'm gathering these, I'm collecting this. This is a collection of shootings. These are people that have been shot in my district since July. I have over 50. This is just one PSA. I have two. This PSA happens to send me receipts. So I have those receipts, but these are human lives. These are people, grandmothers, children, husbands, wives that did absolutely nothing in some cases that were shot in their own buildings, in their own communities. And so I would like to know, independent of activating public spaces, which I am a huge proponent of, and independently of opening up community centers, what is NYCHA doing to address the public safety issues at their developments, because it does not appear to me that NYCHA even acknowledges that there's a public safety crisis happening within their own buildings. We have state cameras that are not functional. We have poor lighting, if lighting at all. These issues are never addressed in a timely matter. We have doors that are broken consistently. So I really would love for NYCHA, and I know what the PSAs are doing, and I know what the, what the, the police precincts are doing, and I appreciate that. 
But in a lot of these cases, we cannot police our way out of these issues. There are things that we can do proactively to avoid a lot of these circumstances from happening. So I have two questions. One, again, what is NYCHA doing to address the public safety issues at their developments? And two, how quickly is NYCHA addressing um, the broken cameras and the lighting issues um, at those developments? And actually, I'll add a third question because I would love to know what type of relationship NYCHA has with residents once a shooting has occurred. I had a, 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 an older lady who had two sons that were shot on the same day, one fatal, one critical. She had to live next door to her son's shooter's family for months before she was transferred out of that apartment. That is very traumatic and it is dangerous for both families. And in neither case did NYCHA intervene until we forced that on them. So I would love to hear what uh, NYCHA's responses to these questions are. Um, thank you for your question, ma'am, and your concerns are all concerns too, as with anything with uh, the safety and the security of our residents. As you're aware, with your help, uh, there's a, a grant that's coming from HUD where we're looking to improve the lighting uh, at uh, Jefferson houses and different houses within your development. Uh, I know it's not enough. We need all the help that we can get. I like to thank all the electeds who have uh, participated and gave us funding for cameras and things of that nature. Uh, Jefferson Johnson, I can remember patrolling that as a, a housing cop and it was somewhat better back in the day, but that's centuries ago. I realize that we have issues there. We're working to try and correct those issues. Your other question is uh, about the incident with someone who had to leave, live next to a, um, I would say a perpetrator for lack of a better word. Uh, that should not have happened. We have a whole unit assigned right to NYCHA in the event for the, something happens and we need an emergency transfer. Um, I don't know all the your details for that particular one, but some of that stuff comes through me. I am not the one that handles it, but I participate and work closely with the NYPD. And they bring to my attention that they have a victim of a crime. Time or expired. A witness, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, or a witness uh, of a crime that we need to find adequate uh, housing for. We have a unit that looks at that uh, carefully and we try to make the move as quick as possible. It should not take, I think you said a couple of months, four weeks or a month, it should not. If it's something of that nature, we should move as, as, as quick as possible. I think that answered too. Uh, what was the other question, ma'am? So we've had, we've had incidents where we have had shootings and when the police department or the family members are asking for the footage to be retrieved, there is no footage because the cameras that we're hoping to fund are non-operational. So who's keeping track of whether or not the cameras are actually working? Are, are they maintained? How often and when they break, how quickly does it take? How, how, how long does it take before somebody actually comes in and, and, and repairs not only the cameras, but the lighting and the doors? That also falls under me. We have a closed circuit TV unit that's uh, uh, responsible for maintaining uh, once Capital installs the cameras or the NYPD Taru installs the cameras. It's then turned over to me. As well, you know, we have something like 219 developments that have cameras there. Some are new and like anything else, like I said earlier, well, I didn't say earlier, but I spoke about this with my partners, that technology is as such, you install the latest and the greatest today, two months from now, it's down. Our cameras are month, uh, our cameras are, should be checked every day by the management. If there's an issue, they're supposed to let us know. We have, we generate a document each day for all the cameras that are triple low, excuse me, all the cameras that are out of order. Uh, our unit, within the closed circuit TV, we have uh, some electricians and people whose job is to uh, mon not monitor, check and reinstall and fix all of this shedding, move the cameras, they should respond and try, make an attempt to fix it. Sometime it works, sometime it happens. Our portfolio, we have cameras that could be 15 years old. We have some cameras two to three years old. We have some camera uh, systems that uh, 
I would venture to say that the contract for maintenance is over. I thank you once again for those of you who have given us uh, cameras out of your budget. Uh, mm -hmm. But also we need to have strong um, extended warranties to fix whenever they go out. But that falls under the closed circuit TV unit to fix those cameras that are broke or to bring uh, or, or to try and replace saying. Does that answer? I think, I, I think yes, I know. I mean, I just, I would love to see NYCHA be a little bit more proactive in their interactions with the council because if you're having issues, if cameras need to be upgraded, we're not finding out from NYCHA. We're finding out from residents. We're finding out from victims. We're finding out from the NYPD. Uh, you know, quite frankly, my experiences with NYCHA have been very, you know, uh, negative in terms of the public safety issues. You know, I, I bring them up, you know, we try to, you know, incorporate programs where we're activating public spaces at some of the NYCHA developments and some of them we have cornerstones and some of them we don't, um, you know, many of them still need uh, community centers and it would be really nice to have NYCHA advocating for these things as opposed to having to wait until somebody gets shot or murdered for us to have to force it upon the administration or anyone else uh, for that matter, I think is insulting to the people that live there. And quite frankly, you are the landlord. The NYPD is not the landlord. And this is the problem is that we continue to use the NYPD for the, you know, the, the solution to all of our problems. And a lot of these problems can be remediated without the use of the NYPD um, at all, right? We can, we can advocate for these services and these things. And so I'm running out of time and I know that my colleagues have questions, but I plan to put some, uh, you know, a multi-agency um, public safety plan together uh, for East Harlem and the South Bronx for this summer. And I hope that NYCHA can participate in that, in, in that planning process. Before you leave, absolutely, ma'am. I'll, I'll be more than happy to uh, participate in that. We appreciate our partners at city council members, uh, at the city council. And I'm looking forward to working with you on this issue now. Thank you. I just have some a, a follow up to um, Councilmember Ayala's question, um, Chief Nelson. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that the cameras should be checked daily, and if there are issues, there's a document that's drafted and there to report this information. So, who is checking the cameras daily, and how are they checking them? The each of uh, the cameras that are assigned to a development the manager should have a access to those cameras. Someone should be checking that daily to see, to make sure the cameras are working. In addition to that, if the new shedding was put up, that manager should be the first person or whoever's in charge of monitoring the cameras. It's under the manager, whoever she de designates to do that, should be checking to see whether that, that camera now the shedding has been blocked. And each day there is a report generated uh, that's sent to my shop letting us know from my closed circuit TV, which cameras are down. Also the NYPD with the Viper bases that covers uh, 28 developments, 24-7 uh, with uh, police coverage. We receive, excuse me, we receive a report from them on which cameras are down. So, so Madam Chair, the, the Viper cameras that Chief Nelson is referring to, we have 3,114 of those Viper cameras. They are monitored um, within the PSAs and they're checked, not daily, they're, they're basically checked hourly and we would get that report of any malfunctioning out to um, NYCHA and to Chief Nelson uh, for, for repair. So there's an expectation of a daily check for all cameras. There's an expectation by the property manager, not, I mean, not by, um, I'm not talking about NYPD, but just by NYCHA. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then once you receive that report, then there's some type of work order, something generated if there are issues, right? I would say so. Something is generated. Once we receive the report, uh, once we receive the report that there's a camera down, it goes to the closed circuit TV, it's a uh, unit, it's up to them to see if it's fixable or it might be an old camera, whatever the case might be, to investigate and see what the problem is. And then what happens then? If it's fixable, I'll, uh, uh, my electricians or those who work in the camera unit will go there and make the fix, make the fix, make the correction, fix the uh, broken camera. If the camera is beyond repair, then we're back to square root one where we're trying to uh, 
uh, we place said camera. And if it's if it's too old, then we're uh, we try we'll have to try and replace it or get funding to update uh, the cameras. Okay. Okay. Do you have a number of how many cameras at this very moment are not working? Compared to uh, how many how many cameras you have, and how many of those are not working? Close to eighteen thousand cameras. I can't. I I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't have the exact number that, of the ones that are down. But I would be gladly to uh, be happy to forward that to the council, ma'am. Okay. I just I, I have some other questions related to that, but I'll just stop there because I know that Councilmember Barron is next, so I'll I'll end there. We'll now take questions from Councilmember Barron, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you. I want to thank the chair for holding this very, very critical uh, topic hearing. And I want to thank the panel for their participation and presentation. Uh, I also want to commend the chair for having those most directly impacted by the situation precede the city presentation so that the city can hear directly what it is that the residents are encountering. They may hear it from time to time, but certainly hearing, the, hearing those issues in a formal city council hearing has another impact uh, to presenting the issues that we're facing. It also gives an opportunity to personalize the horrors and the atrocities that they have been subjected to, uh, whether they be one time occurrence or whether they be an ongoing situation. So we appreciate all of those who came and shared their story with us. I particularly want to talk about Carter G. Woodson Houses, which is in my district. And we've had meetings, uh, Zoom meetings with NYCHA, with NYPD, and in fact, with some of those persons who were impacted by the deaths, at least four that we know of attributed to an individual, by the deaths of residents in the Carter G. Woodson houses. It's been an issue that has been of grave concern. It's been addressed by myself, as well as Assembly Member Charles Barron, Assembly Member Latrice Walker, Council Member Alika Abbey Samuel, and Senator Prasad. All of us have expressed our concern and moving past that concern, coming to a resolution of addressing the situation of security. I believe Ms. James, I didn't hear all of her testimony, but I believe she talked about even a simple direct system of having people validate who they are in order to gain entry into a building, it's particularly we're talking about a senior building. And moving beyond that daily kind of uh, procedure protocol that can be readily implemented, we also have issues with the contract that has been extended, particularly at Carter G. Woodson Houses. I don't know if it's a contract with the uh, same developer, I mean, the same provider in other, in other uh, institutions and campuses around the city or not, but this particular one, uh, there's an issue with that. Ultimately, or the bigger issue or the big challenge that we're looking at are cameras. So the assembly people, as well as the council people have stepped up to do what the city via NYCHA has not done. I see that as your responsibility. And I certainly know that the state and the city have underfunded NYCHA. That's without question. That's been a pattern that they have underfunded and disinvested any kind of finances. Well, for people who are so excited about the new administration and they should be, here's an opportunity. And of course, this is not within your purview, but here's an opportunity for this new administration to step up and provide money to addressing the issues that exist and support what's going on that needs to be corrected in NYCHA. But my direct question to you is, where are we? The last meeting that we had, the last press event that we had, it was said that, oh, NYCHA expected that by the summer, they would start. We have not gotten any updates of any timetable. 
what we were told is, oh, it has to go to the comptroller. And perhaps he has someone listening to this so that he could be able to respond to that issue as well. Where are we in this timetable? What are the next steps? When will we see operational cameras functioning, particularly at Carter G. Woodson houses? Those are my direct questions. Can you hear me? Anybody heard me? Nitra, have you heard me? I heard you. I'm waiting for my partner to answer. He's going okay. to answer that now. Thank you. Um, I was just unmuted. Uh, okay. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Okay. Um, so uh, you are correct, as we've been engaging with the development staff uh, and as well as the TA and Office of Safety and Security. Uh, there is a, a project at Woodson that was funded from the city and uh, the project has gotten approval from OMB. So we have gotten the CP, the project was funded, the design was completed, the CP is completed. Um, it is now moving over to the comptroller's office as you have mentioned, that is correct. And uh, we're hoping that construction can start as long as we get a, um, a contract registration in May of 2021 or in the spring. What is keeping this contract from being registered? Because I heard this at least six weeks ago. What is keeping the contract from being, are, we, are you saying to me that the comptroller's office is not doing what they should be doing in a timely fashion? We're working with our partners. As I mentioned, this just came back from the OMBCP. There is a, a procurement process by which uh, the FMS system or the financial system, the documents then have to go into that system and over to OMB for a CP approval. They come back through the FMS system and, and added their documents and that goes over to the comptroller. Um, we work with the comptroller's office regularly. They have been very, very helpful for with us all through the pandemic as staff have not been in office. Um, and I will say we've really gotten a lot of support from OMB and the comptroller and the DOI who does all of the VNC processes. We are, you know, we're really pushing these projects along um, and, and that's, it's, it's a process, but, but it's going and and the fact is that the design is done and we are, we're getting this over to the comptroller to get the approval. Uh, we, we hope that we, you know, based on comptroller registration, we hope that early spring that we can let me, let me, uh, construction. Thank you. Let me get some particulars because I'm hearing now that you just sent it. Or, uh, I'm interpreting what you're saying now is that it has just recently been sent. When did you send the the uh, project over to OMB. What's the date that it was sent to the comptroller's office? Because I was led to believe it was already there and just waiting to be processed. So when did you send it to the comptroller? So um, I'm opening up the document yes. within the system to tell you when it was, when we received it back from OMB. Okay. And that was February 4th. 2021 is when the approval from OMB is, uh, then that gets put into the FMS system and sent over to us. That package okay. then has to be pulled together for what the comptroller needs. Um, it is my understanding that that has not gone over to the comptroller. We've already, we've already flagged them to let them know that the package is going, um, but it is in that process of all of those documents being uploaded into their system. Okay, so I'm glad and you could believe... say again. I'm sorry. Um, and I will, I can verify, but I know that our team has been uh, communicating regularly with the TA uh, and we'll make sure that we're regularly communicating with you as well to let you know about the progress and the, and the schedule associated to that. Uh, that's fine because the TA has not indicated to me that they have received any update as to what the timeline is. So. Uh, I'm glad that you're saying that, and I will check with the TA to confirm that that is in fact the case. And so now my question to you is, when do you anticipate pulling together all the pieces and whatever, whatever, and putting it into the system? When do you anticipate that it will be at the comptroller's office for his office to take what needs to be done? 
um, based on the schedule, that's supposed to happen this month. So they're pulling it together. So by the end of the week, because this is the month is over. No, I know, I know. Okay. It's all it's all into the finance system, which is putting it into the the system. I it, I hate using the word system. It sounds bureaucratic, but but once we get that CP back, they just upload the documents and the drawings and and the and the FMS and the OMB approvals, and then that gets uh, moved over. And again. Uh, we've been working with the comptroller. This process used to be paperwork where we had to print it all out. And the comptroller has been really gracious to get this uh, system up into an electronic system, which is, is again, every single day that we can speed up our capital projects division. It doesn't matter if it's having dialogue with our other partners with the DOB or the comptroller or OMB or anybody. We can just one day, if we get one more day, or two days or three days, and we can get that schedule better, we're doing that. And that's the goal. Um, we have regular conversations with both OMB, Comptroller, DOB, so that way these projects can move faster. Uh, I thank you for your testimony. And on Monday, I'll be calling the Comptroller to find out uh, when he expects to finalize what it is that he needs to do for this project to move forward. Uh, Madam Chair, I thank you for extending the time to have this issue uh, better clarified. And I wanna thank all of those who gave testimony about their own situations in NYCHA. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question um, related to Woodson. Um, because we heard from residents who said that they knew that the person um, that killed um, the seniors, they knew and they actually reached out to detectives about their concerns uh, um, related to this particular gentleman. And so I just have a question. Um, what is the coordination between the district attorney's office, um, PSA, NYCHA, local precinct detectives, and the residents um, when a violent crime occurs? Like what is the coordinated effort between just speaking to residents uh, if something like that happens? Madam Chair, Ms. Becker, with your permission, um, I, I would just like to start with my condolences to Ms. Chambers for a moving testimony um, at the beginning, my condolences. And uh, in terms of the coordination, uh, we, in the last murder, uh, uh, I was notified. I remember when I got that phone call. It's the police chief's worst nightmare. Um, when you have a serial killer, as you pointed out in your opening, Madam Chair, and one of your elderly um, residents has been murdered, the third one. And uh, the communication was I responded to the scene. Um, after the crime scene was processed, starting with your chief of housing, the chief meeting with the chief of detectives, Chief Rodney Harrison on the scene. Uh, and we were briefed by the homicide detective who worked with Chief Harrison, uh, the PSA commander, um, Inspector Griffin. And as soon as that meeting concluded, I was personally on the phone in a conference call with Ms. Johnson Lieutenant Association President. And I, I remember, you know, speaking to her, briefing her on what exactly was going on, my commitment that I was going to put, in addition to everything that we had done, I was going to put an additional two police officers inside of that building. And that I, I, I would want it, unfortunately, with COVID, um, she was, Miss Johnson's awesome, and she was working to get us um, a a, um, a, a conference call, which she thought was better than a video conference, because many of the elderly don't have the technology to, to do what we're doing. And, and they're isolated, it's terrible. I, I was willing, anytime they wanted to do it, I would have went to them as safely as we could do it. But the communication um, was there with Ms. Johnson and, and the, our tenant association right away. In terms of NYCHA, NYCHA gets a recap from me every 12 hours on everything that happened. So Chief Nelson and Vito Mosachil will get everything from a missing child to a murder every 12 hours. 
from um, the Housing Bureau. But in this case, it was a phone call directly to Chief Nelson. And I spoke to Vito Mustachulo that, um, that morning, the morning after uh, the, the murder. And, um, and, you know, and so the, the coordination is there. In terms of the residential communication after the second murder, um, and it, it's horrible to say second murder, uh, the resident association, I, I bring this up because the, 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 the tenant association and the residents of Woodson are amazing. More than 50 members attended a meeting just prior to COVID um, with the inspector, um, Inspector Griffith, and the case detective who's assigned to this case. And they would cry with our crime prevention specialists, with the inspector, and with the detective. They all really had an open dialogue on what, what they should do to protect themselves, um, what, you know, safety tips, everything that that case detective could tell them regarding that case. And what I found most striking about this meeting was that the tenants of Woodson, elderly, 62 years and older, wanted to form a, a, a floor captain they wanted every floor in Woodson, so 20, 393 is 25 floors, and they wanted a floor captain and a co-floor captain on every single floor in the development. They wanted the police department's help, and they wanted to be our eyes and ears, so meaning that they were able to take care of the residents, the elderly, the older residents that couldn't. And believe it or not, we had nine floors covered in that 24 with volunteers who, who they created this, the tenants of that building, just amazing, our elderly, protecting each other, working with us. So, so Madam Chair, the, the communication is there, uh, you know, and in this, in the last case, I've been with you, I've been ju just over one year now as the housing chief, it's been an incredibly challenging year, but in this case, it started with me, meaning uh, my worst nightmare getting a phone call like that, I, I, you know, I probably had one or two that are up there with this type of a phone call that you get. And that was with a 13 year old on a basketball court when I was the chief of Queen South. So, um, you know, I remember where I was when I got the phone call. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now take questions from council member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Perfect. Thanks so much. This is a sobering conversation. Um, Chair Amphrey Samuel, you are a fearless, um, a fearless leader for the council on this topic. And I really want you to know how much I appreciate you um, getting texts from my tenant leaders appreciating you um, during this hearing. So, so a lot of people's eyes are on you and, and thanking you for your um, oversight on NYCHA, it's, it's very powerful. The first question I have from a tenant leader on this topic um, is the tenant leader at the uh, NYCHA Brownstones. I don't know if you're familiar with those in my district. Um, to NYCHA, I'm, I'm looking to see in hopes that some heads will nod up and down. All right, um, <laughs> thank you. They have cameras. They've not been activated. The tenant leader is being told that uh, the TA leader will have to pay $5,000 a year to pay the contractor to monitor the cameras. So two questions. One is why would the TA be responsible for paying a contractor? And secondly, why aren't the cameras uh, up and going, activated? I can start. Thank you for that question, um, ma'am. Um, I'm not gonna speak on the capital end, I'll speak on the security end. Uh, that's an excellent question. And one of which I have no answer for. I don't understand where the $5,000 uh, fee would come in uh, is this something that they installed privately? 
if it was something that was installed by NYCHA or the city or or yourself, I don't see where the residents will have a fee, ma'am. I would have to I would have to look into that before I give you a definitive answer. Do you have on your computer just the way someone else was able to look up right away? Do you have on your uh, screen? Can you look up no, whether or not you're showing that the brownstones have cameras? No, ma'am. But as we speak, I'm typing up right now to see if somebody can look that up. But I don't have that at my screen. I'm at home. If you could looking. just look up whether or not NYCHA uh, brownstones by Douglas by anyone the brownstones. I'm okay, going to wait for a minute while you do that. My we second continue? question it, it may take is a while. for continue. the, um, I'm sorry? You can continue because this may take just a little while, okay? Right. It's a very, just one question. Does somebody have on a, whether or not the brownstones have cameras? Um, is it in your system? And then my next question is for the procurement um, professional, sort of picks, picks up on uh, Councilmember Barron's questions. Um, first of all, uh, I don't understand why you'd be grateful to the controller for accepting paperwork uh, via uh, the internet. I'm shocked to hear that the controller system wasn't connected to NYCHA via the internet for such a long time. When did they start to accept paperwork digitally? So thank you very much for that. Um, we've been working with the, with the comptroller's office because NYCHA is not a mayoral agency, um, our Processes I are a little that. bit different. I've never been a mayoral agency, Correct. and I'm just wondering exact um, just a date or yep. give me a year. Was it 2020? So, just this year, actually. We've, we've, been, okay. we've been working in 2021. The controller's office, who for the last hundred years has worked with NYCHA, a non mayoral agency, but yet the controller is responsible for approving contracts still, they in 2021 now have a computer connection with you. Just wanting to clarify, yes, no? Yes. Okay, and is that because, or are you now connected by a passport? Or do um, you know what passport is? Yep, no, we, we recognize passport. Um, again, as, a, as you've also stated, we're we're not part of that program, According and so to we where we had a hearing a couple of, of months ago. NYCHA was being folded into the passport system. So, are you being folded in or not? Um, it is my understanding we use these items, but because we are not a mayoral agency, we actually go through HPD um, to pass our documents through to OMB. Um, and as you said, yes, the, up until the pandemic, uh, we were not on uh, an electronic system with the comptroller. We had to print out the documents, bring them over I mean, to the offices. Yeah, I mean, mean, that's if anyone and listening, if you are not like freaked out by that, you should be. So just want to make that clear that that is appalling for the hundreds of thousands of people who live in NYCHA that the controller would, you know, intentionally slow things down by not having an electronic uh, system is, is just like maddening. So I'm sorry, I just had to vent for one quick sentence. And, and where are you on passport? Yes, no, getting so into or is I, but I also want to just finish I that. Know is getting integrated. So to the extent that HPD is, you are. Is that the answer? I, I just want to clarify. So again, we've been working with the comptroller on this. They have been working on a computer system for those, uh, those those firms. Seven, and those seven I years. I mean, sorry, those. All those, right, those let's those, just but, move on because it's really not worth it. Um, back to so it sounds like you're moving toward passport, right? Yes. Well, parts 
for example, a lot of our contractors are able to sign in and do the passports and, and that, but we'll still not be able to so fully be part of the FMS. So you know, do the passports. All it is is a management system. It's not yeah. like mythical or hard, right? And I assume you're the procurement guy. So it, it, it has a lot to do with the different types of funding that capital gets versus the city mayoral agencies. We have state federal please, grants in cities and, please, and that's please, please. I, this stuff is just not hard and using words that other people might not be you know familiar I, with uh you like fms and you know I, the network cps none of this is hard so that's your job is to do this right Uh, I just want to ask about the RAD program to NYCHA. Um, a couple of my developments when I went into RAD over the last few months, and I've been talking with the PSA officers who have gotten no direction about whether or not they're supposed to continue verticals. Um, do, you, do you have a guiding philosophy on that? Councilor Blunt, let me, let me take in terms of the verticals. Um, that the fact that it, the fact that a PSA officer um, is saying that right now. Um, Sorry, uh, let me start over again. What is your policy when a NYCHA building goes into RAD with the relationship between the PSA officers and the set of buildings now that they're in RAD? As of right now, nothing has changed. The Housing Bureau will continue to police it until, um, until that decision. Okay, so FYI. One of my smartest, best PSA officers who you have lauded as an agency and I have lauded and the NYCHA leaders have lauded has no idea because has not been told whether or not to do verticals. So let's not do any blaming. What I'm asking you to do is fix it and be out as, as freaked out as I am and try to fix it, okay? Yes, ma'am, the buck stops right here. I'll fix it today. Okay, and then lastly, and I appreciate your forbearance, Chair Embry Samuel, I really do. But on this camera maintenance stuff, every rosy picture, everything that you all are describing as protocol does not happen, is a fiction in my district, is a fiction in my district. So I have scaffolding up in one of my larger complexes. I visited with a PSA officer and someone from NYCHA three years after the security cameras were installed. Number one, the, the management at NYCHA wasn't even present they don't know anything about the cameras. So no, they had never checked them. Um, the PD, uh, it was the first time they actually were in the room to see that cameras existed for crimes that had existed. And so now they knew they could go back and get film, except for the fact that none of the videos worked because the cameras had all been blocked by trees, by the scaffolding. So I really, everything you just said about how the cameras are supposed to work, I hear what you're saying. And it is so far away from the experience that we have had as to make me wonder, like my residents do, do the cameras mean anything in terms of keeping themselves safe. Every time I have worked with a property manager to say, do you check the feed every day? Do you know how to check the feed? Do you know if the cameras are working, pointed in the right direction? The answer is routinely no, routinely no. So I am shocked to hear that you get regular reports on the functioning 
of the cameras. I am shocked to hear that if that is true, you don't know what the number is today that are functioning or not, something the council member asked. So, I mean, are you, you know, if you're responsible for the cameras, shouldn't you know, like how many were working yesterday? How many were working last week? Do, do you have a census scale? It's, is it 10% that's not functioning every day? Is it 20, 50, 80? Do you have a sense of scale? I can answer your question, ma'am. Um, I'm almost positive, um, excellent question, ma'am. I'm almost positive that the tour that you took was at Amsterdam houses. That might not be the same one you're talking about. Oh, no, but it I was I, I was with you on that tour. Yeah. With the or with the officer, yeah. and the officer, and the officer was pointing out where he wanted the cameras to be pointed. That's right. Because and who started that meeting? Oh, right, the council member. And what did he even know that he had had the ability, the ability to say to NYCHA, "This is where I want the cameras pointed"? No, he did not. So my apologies for not remembering you were there, but what I remember from that meeting is that it was a learning experience for everyone. And yes, I set up that meeting. That meeting was set up at my request. So I'm sorry, what were you gonna say about it? And I have how much percentage of cameras are out on any given day? Does anyone know? Does anyone the brownstone cameras that are at that location were not installed by Capital. Um, we received uh, the current number that's out of, uh, for cameras are 139. So I hope that answers the question that you asked about how many cameras. Is that cameras an average are. number? Is that high? Is that low? What percentage of the total is that? I would have to do the math now, ma'am. I don't have that answer. I looked if, up if, your if 150 a big number, what was it last week? 350? Was it 150 last week? I can't, I could not answer that question, ma'am. But you're saying you get this information every morning? Maybe I misheard you. No, no, I said that there is a report generated that's sent to my unit, the closed circuit TV unit that receives a report of the cameras and they also generate a report that's sent out to let out those know which cameras are out. Right, but you, you hear my questions. I mean, it's pretty insane. You should know, I mean, I, I, you know, for the purposes of, I mean, everyone knows what I'm saying, so I'm not gonna repeat it. Uh, let me just say this, uh, five years ago, I um, toured the closed circuit, the office, at NYCHA Central, where the officers are looking at the closed circuit cameras. They were taking down the information with paper and pen that they saw. The information then went to another unit that converted those handwritten notes into something that, um, sorry, something digital. And then the next day, that digital report was sent to the person who was in charge of that unit. That was something that I mentioned to City Hall five years ago. Has that been corrected or, or is it still guys with pens and pencils and paper writing down what they're seeing? I cannot answer that question, ma'am, but we will be happy. I personally, and we will be happy to Have meet you with you and, dis and, and, and discuss this issue with you further. Who is it that oversees that room of people who are writing down information from the camera? One of my supervisors that works in that uh, particular building, in that particular center that you toured. Uh, Have you ever asked him about it? this? No, ma'am. Out of the 18 um, 
we have a, currently 139 cameras that are out out of 18,000 cameras uh, all on our NYCHA portfolio. That you know about. That's actually a fact, ma'am, yes. Well, it can't be a fact if you don't have people looking at the monitors. And I know for a fact that the property managers in my district do not look or nor do they know how to look at their cameras. So honestly, be, I mean, just really, uh, that you know of, there are 130. It was 150 two minutes ago, but it's 130. I never said 150, ma'am. Okay, I my said bad, 130. 130. I said 139 right from the beginning. 139. You said, was it 150 before? I said, I, that I don't know, ma'am. Okay, I gave bad. you a number. 139. Like I said, I am I am happy to meet with you to discuss these issues. You don't issues, need to meet with me. I think you need to meet with your tenant leaders, your property managers. I think you need to get out in the road and do some in investigative work yourself. Um, but that's not for me to say. Um, just sort of sharing experiences with you from my community. And, and I just want you to know that I'm heartbroken. I'm just heartbroken for my- Okay, ma'am. Um, for my night to residents. Thank you again, Chair Amprey Samuel. So um, I appreciate that line of questioning on Council Member Rosenthal. And I will say that um, that's one of the reasons why I asked the question specifically, um, who's going out there um, and if that was the intent and the expectation that is the property managers that are checking on this daily and, you know, and is it a daily report? And I ask that question because I know that the meetings that I have with my residents and our property managers, um, they're inundated with issues related to mold and elevators and trash pickups and everything else. And especially COVID right now, there are so many other things that are, that um, safety and security obviously should be priority but it's not something that I um, get a lot of reports about from the property management staff. It's usually maintenance issues related to, again, trash and mold and different things. And so I was kind of shocked when you said that they're doing um, this daily check every day, because that's just not my experience when it comes to um, um, information that we receive from the property management staff. So they, if, I'm, if I may, ma'am, it's under their purview, and when I say property manager, I guess I, sh I misspoke. I shouldn't say pro property manager. I should say his or her designee. Because it's in the manager's office or the superintendent's office, someone's supposed to be checking that th those cameras uh, at least sometime during the day, once a day, to make sure that all are together, make sure there's no vandalism on the cameras themselves, and making sure that they're operable. So when I said management, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, someone from the manager's office or the superintendent should be uh, looking at that now, sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, that's, that's helpful with clarification, but still in addition, like as a follow-up, that is still something that is um, intriguing for me because again, the polls that we get and the complaints that, that we get and receive um, are related to everything else outside of checking the cameras. And um, that's just shocking. I would think that I would have more information related to cameras and security if this is something that they're looking at and doing every single day and reporting on every single day. Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Audrey? Thank you. We'll now take questions from Council Member Adams. In time. Thank you very much. And um, Chair Amprey Samuel, you are doing an amazing job with this hearing. Um, however helpless I'm feeling right now over the subject matter, but thank you so much, especially for allowing the residents to speak. Um, I think that it is absolutely our responsibility to hear the voices of the people, particularly when it comes to NYCHA. Uh, and their situations because they are not heard often enough. They are not amplified often enough. So thank you for letting the residents speak. Uh, Chief Barrera, I must say Queen South is not the same without you. And it's- mm -hmm. um, uh, You know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I have to stick on the camera issue because I'm baffled. Um, 
uh, I'm, I'm just baffled. And, and Council Member Ayala started, I believe she started the conversation uh, about an hour or so ago um, with regard to the camera situation, just everything that we're getting now and peeling this onion back. You know, I represent District 28 where South Jamaica houses and Baisley houses are. And one of the most prevalent complaints aside from voluminous maintenance issues, has to do with security and cameras and lighting. And quite frankly, uh, Chief Nelson, I'm not sure that we've uh, met uh, before, but um, to, the, the responses are just so disheartening uh, in hearing that uh, Councilor Ayala, I believe asked you about lighting and you said that you are quote, looking to get a grant for lighting um, that's unacceptable. The, the residents need help. Um, there is a tremendous quality of life issue that persists. Um, we've been talking about cameras now for, I, I, I dare say, 45 minutes at least. And for me, going around in circles about the issue of cameras has to be the most disturbing thing as one who has funded um, lighting and cameras actually for my NYCHA buildings. Uh, do you know what the typical turnaround time is for repair once, once your unit is made aware of a camera outage? Well, uh, thank you for that question, ma'am. The issue for Jamaica houses, uh, that's a Viper base. And I would venture to say, my God, when I was uh, a full inspector or a captain, that's when they put in, they were uh, first put in place. So we're talking like the mid nineties. I have no idea whether they were updated or not since that time. Um, the turnaround time on camera, it, on cameras being fixed largely depends on what the issue is for that particular camera. I'm not sure I will have to look up and see what Baisley has, but the cameras that are at Jamaica houses are one of the first Viper bases that we did yep. Uh, when yep. the housing police was still there. So if those are the same original cameras, ma'am, we might have an issue where those cameras are down. Now, when I mentioned before about a HUD grant, I was just yeah. bringing to the attention that I was really thanking that particular city council member because I understand that she was very vocal and, 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 and instrumental and in for us pushing for that grant. The monies that we have for cameras, uh, lead access doors, uh, are not funding that NYCHA has. I think you know exactly what NYCHA is going through. And that's why we really depend on our electeds like yourself and other city council members or borough president members or the, 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 the state uh, state or uh, the governor or Cy Vance or whoever to help us out uh, not to take but money I'm from- aware. Yeah, I'm well, I'm well aware. I'm well aware okay, so when, when you uh, say funding that- that, that, that comes in that be, you need that we that we must provide that we want to provide goodness right. knows if we could provide more we'd be doing that so it's not a thing that we're not uh putting in because we have the money to do so we have so many issues safety and security is utmost important for NYCHA absolutely it's in the forefront but we just don't have the funding to spend like NYCHA would love to spend and that's why we depend on people like yourself, ma'am. Yeah. I can get answers for, on you for Baisley, but I can just surmise that if Jamaica Houses still has the same bank that they had from before, I can see maybe there'll be some issues with cameras over that particular location. Yeah. But we don't monitor that. That would be the NYPD and maybe somebody from their tower or somebody can speak more okay. at length about uh, Jamaica Houses. David, do you have anything on that? Do you know? We have, I don't know, I don't know if they're updated. I'm, I'm expired. I have seven, oh, I, I, I have uh, 260 cameras in South Jamaica and 10 in Baisley. They're monitored 24 seven by police officers. We have seven police officers. We've decentralized our old Viper units, which used to be in a room. And now right within PSA nine and within the satellite uh, in PSA nine for, for Queens North. Uh, yeah. They're monitored by police officers. So, um, okay. Okay. Um, well, you know, again, we've got a long way to go, um, you know, with, with all of this. And as one of the residents said, 
you know, with a lot of these discussions and conversations, it really seems like a lot of times, unfortunately, that we're spinning our wheels. Um, and uh, I personally feel helpless um, too often when it comes to wanting to do my very best for my constituents um, in the development. But we're going to keep on working on it and battering it away because that's what we do and that's what we have to do. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Councilman Adams. Um, has NYCHA conducted, a, so after the security um, questions, we are definitely gonna move right into MAP. Um, has NYCHA conducted a security assessment of their campuses? You know, like Viper cameras are here and, you know, this is, you know, cameras that are not part of the, you know, what PSA is monitoring and, um, you know, this is where we need, you know, like new doors and hair cameras here that are 10 years old, and now we have to get new cameras. So has there been an overall security assessment? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, we do assessment of all of our portfolio, all of the buildings, all of the developments within NYCHA. As well, you know, we have close to 300 uh, developments and probably close to 2,500 uh, buildings. So we're unable to do all 2,500 within a year. So we do it biannually. Over uh, a year's time, we like to cover at least half of our portfolio. We are down for the COVID period like everyone else because we could, just couldn't get our, our, get our teams out to do the assessments. The assessments are things that we, we um, we look at elevator, uh, ele ele elevator machine rooms, and that's an area where people, homeless can go up and stay, rooftop, stairwell, entrances, interior, exterior lightings, uh, doors, uh, uh, maintenance areas, storage rooms, uh, cameras. We do a complete assessment of all of those locations. Now, you got to bear in mind that one development can take three, three days or one day, if you go to a campus like um, Wagner or Queensbridge, that assessment can take several days to be done. And in conjunction with my team that does the assessment, we have, part, we have our partners from the manager staff that help us go out, help my crew teams go out and do the assessments. Once the assessment is done, the document is prepared, we send it uh, to the management and also the borough level to show them what, what deficiencies that we have found. And so this way, uh, necessary corrections, if possible, can, can be taken care of. Now, it can be as simple as a door not missing from the roof landing door to as serious as the roof landing door off the hinges or the front door or, or rear door is not working properly or the storage area doesn't seem to be secured enough because we've had our recent burglary there. So we do do assessments, ma'am. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so I just wanna run through these questions real quick to have sure, them, um, you know, as part of the, the, the hearing itself and on the record. How many active security enhancement projects are there within the NYCHA portfolio right now? And I'm looking for the number of projects to install CCTV cameras the number of projects to install layered access control and the number of projects to install temporary or permanent lighting enhancements. And so, you know, we just asked a question about the security assessment and since you have all that information, um, you know, we just wanna kind of get into just detail as to the active security enhancement projects currently within your portfolio. And Stephen's trying to- Thank you very much. Um, I can speak to that. Uh, there are, it's roughly around um, 50 million uh, uh, worth of security projects. That's 25 CCTV programs, 10 layered access control and nine lighting enhancements. And that's happening at around 40, um, sorry, 36 developments. Can you we, say, one more time? say it one more time. So there's about uh, about 50.9 uh, 
$50,944,209 to be exact at, at around 36 developments where we're installing uh, 25 CCTV unit projects, 10 layered access control projects, and nine uh, lighting enhancements. And um, And how many developments have no security features at all? Like right now at this very moment, there are no security features. I'll, I'll hand that over. I will, I'll answer that. Thank you for that question. All of our developments have locked doors, have lighting, have uh, uh, mm -hmm. lighting in the uh, walkways. So we all, all of our facilities all, within our portfolio have some sort of security mechanism, but they may not have enhanced like the new LED lighting or the new, um, new, new camera mm -hmm. banks, but all we have no open, no place where the doors are non-existent and lights not existent. So we all have, they all have security uh, enhancements now. Um, Stephen, going back to the 50 million um, worth of security projects, does that include the um, grant that came from HUD or what, or is this um, DASNY money or combination of all? Can you break that down? Yep. Um, so the majority of that is city council funding. Um, there, I think was one project in there that is a SAM grant, which is a state grant from an assembly member. Uh, that does not include the new HUD grant, which um, we're very fortunate to get. And again, um, I think the, the HUD grant is an example where we're looking at many, many different ways in which to leverage funding. We just recently got a grant from LMDC actually, and it was for uh, $12 million where we were able to put in LED lighting upgrades based on the map uh, details and designs and those are all completed now, um, all done in the lower Manhattan areas. And so I think the grant illustrates, you know, it's never enough, right? We, we, we need additional funding. The city has been generous enough to outspend the federal government at this point in time, almost more than three to one. And we really do appreciate this administration and the council and the borough president's support. Um, uh, but that said, we're also always reaching out and trying to find new funding. I think um, uh, NYPD indicated that we just got a new grant for the basketball courts. And I know that that's not CCTV, um, but it was, an it was an ability for us to re-leverage um, how we can get funds and to bring that in. And we're gonna be doing you know, 15 of those courts and we're very fortunate to have that, those funds to do that. But um, that does not, to answer your question, that does not, those do not include the grant because we haven't We've, we've received in terms of the agreement of the grant, but we haven't received the funding for the grant. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I know we are two hours in <laughs> to this, this oversight here right now, and we are just getting to um, map. Um, and, I, and, and I just want to just be clear that this conversation that we've had so far um, I think the next conversation that we're going to have with um, Mock J around Matt will allow us to see, you know, some, you know, possible solutions um, with the pilot program. And so um, with that, I want to, wait, let me see. Um, with that, I'm going to go into um, our map conversation. But I want to preface that with saying, why are we having such an increase in crime and in public housing when investments were made by the city? And in particular, we are having an increase in crime in developments that are adjacent to map sites. And as an example of what I'm saying, Woodson Houses is directly across the street from Van Dyke Houses. And Van Dyke Houses is a map site. And so um, I would like to, during this conversation, you know, keep that as a, 
a, a backdrop of the conversation itself um, and put it into context because it'll be great to hear all the amazing work that you're doing. Um, but there are also some concerns around, you know, neighborhood stat and the conversations that you have during neighborhood stat, which includes all of the like community members. And so if we are investing in the map developments and sites, but we're seeing seniors murdered directly across the street from a map site, that raises concern for me. And so um, instead of me interjecting when you're saying something, just remember that that's in the back of my head. And so um, I just wanted to put that out there so we can have, again, a real honest and productive um, conversation. So how has COVID-19 affected MAP and other crime prevention programs in NYCHA? And what agencies are involved in MAP? So we can start there. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about MAP. So I want to start with framing the issue. As you know, for many years, the administration has spent, has invested a substantial amount of money that has not obviously, as you indicated, prevented us from addressing the problems of violence that we experience in MAP, in NYCHA, citywide, and also nationwide in terms of of murders, particularly on gun violence. So we are absolutely concerned about that. We see some improvements there. We are not never happy with the current situation and we are trying to address. Particularly COVID had a very dramatic impact on our program. It, it, it allowed us to run some of the key elements of MAP. So MAP is not just about infrastructure development, it's not just about program lights, it's not about infrastructure, it's not really about access cameras, layer CCT. The key element of MAP is to be responsive to the concerns of the citizens and to make sure that citizens are actually the creators of public safety and we are not so reliant on the police. So that was certainly one of the elements that was most impacted, our ability to connect. So MAP was operating, was connecting with the citizens, but we know certainly in two areas that we have already mentioned, then we saw areas in which it was difficult to address the problems of gun violence. Certainly in order to address the problem of gun violence, you need the cooperation and the participation of the citizens. You need people to come forward as witnesses, people to come forward as a, certainly a, to testify, et cetera. We, as a NYCHA has indicated, we have seen some inability to move certain people as front, as quickly as in the past. We know quite often the shooter and the victims are neighbors. That creates a lot of problems. So certainly we want to, that is an area where we have seen hamper our ability, our ability to connect people, you know, ability to move folks to other areas. The second thing where we saw, and we are trying to address, and I think the mayor has addressed this in an administration is, we started obviously with MAP, as you indicated at the same time, and then through the Office of Neighborhood Safety, we also run our kill violence prevention program. And what we are trying to do is to make sure that there is greater levels of communication between those two programs. Now they are all integrated on the, the leadership of Eric Camberback, our deputy director for the Office of Neighborhood Safety. And what we expect is to have a full approach, citywide approach, then coordinate the work the MAP is doing, which as I said before, is not sufficient. We think the results are there, but it's not sufficient. But also the amounts of uh, good work that the cure violence fo uh, folks have been doing. That's why the mayor obviously uh, provided is doubling the funding for cure violence. And uh, it's also launching this joint force to end gun violence. It's going to be the central focus. So although MAP, uh, itself is not designed to end violence because obviously that is the work the police is a way, you know, to address issues of enforcement is the police is a non enforcement approach to violence. And we are most dedicated to figure out new ways to, to uh, do it in this year. We see some, the last thing I would say we should see as some signs and things are restoring at least in our map sites. There are two indicators I can tell you if you have a moment is what well, we see, for instance, murders are down right now in a map. Uh, shootings are even. 
And the second is we track very quick uh, in all the developments and the 15 sites, we track the number of weeks in which we don't have a shooting. And we have during the in last year, during the summer and the fall, that's, those numbers were terrible. Right now we have at least seven, eight sites that haven't seen a shooting since October or November. I can, so we are trying to figure out ways to look at what we are doing in those sites in cooperation with the multiple agencies to figure out how to expand to the additional agencies. So I'm sorry, to the additional sites about it. So can you just give us a list of the map? Where has MAP struggled? Like, where have you struggled? And then compare that to where have you been able to succeed um, so that, you know, yeah. and put that in the backup of as you are planning to expand or be able to use the lessons learned um, from this model program to, you know, other development. So, you know, like so, you said, what are some of the- I can, tell, I, I can tell you what we are, we think, we are struggling right now, and also where we are seeing some uh, signs of improvement. So, for instance, I would say certainly St. Nichols, Van Dyke, Wagner, Peter, uh, Patterson, Kings, Queensbridge, and Red Hook are all areas where we have been shootings in the last uh, 15 weeks. Those are areas that we are monitoring very, very closely to identify what are the patterns that are driving there. As the chief explained, are they gang-related uh, gang activities? A measures are not working as effectively as it is an issue of the ability and the need to provide a, to help the victims and provide greater victims assistance. We see, however, other areas where we are identifying a, a improvements, whether it is in Brownsville, for instance, we haven't seen a shooting for 27 weeks in the sky there in Boulevard, 27 weeks. A, a Stapleton, 33 weeks. Um, and then one particular side is 49 weeks. And it, so we see some areas where we think that some of the things that we are doing there probably are going to be applicable to it. But again, I want to emphasize the purpose of MAP is not just, it's not to prevent crime, but to address the root causes that are driving crime. We are not a crime probation strategy in the, in the sense and in the enforcement sense. We are addressing those kind of things that we think ultimately are leading to a greater levels of crime. So we need to connect people. As I said, we need to be a responsive. We need to make sure that People see government as a partner in this process. Those are the kind of things that MAP needs to do. We need to do greater levels of outreach. We need to do more work, obviously, in community centers. We need to do more work, certainly, in outreach to youth, in outreach to domestic, domestic violence uh, victims, et cetera, in order to have a much more fuller, robust uh, a strategy that improves uh, those particular sites. Well, I have a question related to that. Um, how long has MAP been in existence? MAP has been in existence since uh, the summer of 2014. 2000, summer of 2014? Yes. Right. And so let's take out 2020. Let's right, we'll just remove 2020. So that would be five years? We can, five years, right? Mm -hmm. Five years of working with community, working with crisis management system, care violence organizations, working with young people, residents, resident leaders, working with NYPD who research and analyze mm -hmm. crime, data, prevention, everything. So all of these folks at the table over the course of five years, at what point um, you know, can you say that it's a, a, you know, a program that should be uh, escalated or expanded to other developments? I mean, can you, can you say that you have been able to reach a point by you know, your studies and think tanks and lessons learned, um, and this is what we need to do 
to, to prevent crime and really address crime in NYCHA developments and campuses. Um, because I think you have like some amazing people at the table. So I'm just trying to figure out where's the, like, still that why. Like, so you just I, I would, why we're still seeing crime. So if I may, I, I will address that uh, from addressing two indicators, which I think might be relevant for this conversation. So what we have done is we, uh, if through an independent evaluation, we have looked at map size to talk about what is the level of collective efficacy that we see in those areas. What is the level of cohesion, partnership with government, et cetera. And what we see, for instance, in every map uh, development through the surveys that we have conducted is that that brings people closer to government and to create these strong neighborhoods. That is what five years of map has done. So for instance, summer youth employment in map size compared to not map size, you see 30% greater acknowledgement of the summer youth employment program. And you know how important the summer youth employment program is not just as a strategy in order to be a, to improve obviously the lives of folks in during the summer, but we know that summer youth employment program reduces mortality, reduces crime, reduces incarceration, reduces more murder rates of the long, in the long term. So connecting people to something as important as the summer youth program is a big difference. 10 points higher than comparable size. The same thing with political athletic leagues, the same thing with Shape Up New York. Every program that we evaluated on the ability of, of MAP to connect to people, we saw the MAP sites have performed and better than similar situated uh, NYCHA sites. So that is on our goal, again, to connect people to services, to connect people to government, to create a strong things. A, there is a very powerful indicator, in my opinion, which is, a, and some folks are catching on these, on the ability, for instance, on how willing you are to help your neighbor. And what we see is that one of the big differentiators of crime in the city is whether in the neighborhoods where we see that people are more willing to help their neighbors and to have this sense of a strong community are more have handled much better the increase in gun violence and, and, and other areas of crime than we have seen. So we certainly, that's what we strive to and aspire in MAP, and I think that's a way to do it. The second thing is, as I said to you before, we have also done a thorough statistical analysis, not just in our office with outside partners from John Jay College, et cetera, who have conducted evaluations, and over long term, they have seen that again, MAP has outperformed other sites. I think the chief referred also to some of those gains, how over time. Yes, I acknowledge and I will admit 2020 has been, as I said, difficult locally, et cetera. So I, I am not in a position obviously to say whether or not she, this should be a span. This is obviously a, for other folks to make those decisions, but I want to stress that we, from our perspective, what we see is we have the indicators and the goals and the targets that we have set, I think we are meeting as a, with the problems that we are facing, of course. And we also think that it's a model, this neighbor, for instance, a key ingredient aspect of our work, which is neighborhoods that bringing together multiple residents with CADG agencies to be responsive. It's a model that we see now being adopted in many other cities around the country, because the idea that you will put city residents a, in a place and ask city agencies like ours to be responsive to what the citizens want not just what the citizen agencies want, I think is crucial. It's the future, is the way in which we could produce safety. So since you mentioned neighborhood stat, and, I, and, and just for the record, neighborhood stat groups um, consist of residents, community-based organizations, city agencies, they meet quarterly to identify emerging issues, ensure resident voices are heard, develop solutions, and track how effectively MAP programs and initiatives are resulting in crime reduction, right? So yeah. have, um, what type of information is collected during the, the neighborhood stat meetings and how does MAP analyze that data that is collected? So let me first address a neighborhood study is not just a MACJ initiative. As I said, it, we bring there a number of agencies in addition to NYCHA and the police department. There are members from Park Sanitation, the Department of Youth, DOP, the Office of 2N, a gun violence, sorry, to end domestic violence, 
and others who are our partners in this process as needed, right? And they are run through and often in coordination with the Center for Core Innovation. It, the kind of information that are, we are looking to connect is a, in those neighborhoods, it's not just the traditional data, which we have obviously on, you know, a, whether or not a, you know, what crimes are up and down. We are trying to connect the kind of information that you were asking, Niger, is are we picking up the garbage and what do you think that is an impact on creating corners that are not working efficiently and where people are congregating to, in order to do crime? Are we, do we have cameras that work or not? Do we have, our lights too strong, too problematic? We invested, as you know, uh, in those infrastructure that I mentioned, those $200 million and administration, we don't just want to invest, to invest in those. We want to hear what citizens and residents think of that. They often tell us, you know, we think the lights are too bright, too not too bright. We think the bright uh, are a problem. Sometimes what they will tell us is, as you have said, sometimes there is a displacement effect. A, you have crime in one area and you have put lights in some area, you displace crime to other areas. How are we addressing that displacement of crime? And, and certainly, some of the concerns that they have certainly with our partners, particularly law enforcement and uh, Chief Ferrer knows very well about these, you know, things as to, are we doing verticals when we are not doing verticals? Are we safe in the summer? What are, a, are we, do we have enough a, a stability? So that's the kind of information and certainly happy to provide more information about the program to your office if needed. I know you know very well about the program or to all the council members my a uh, the executive director for map can certainly reach out and provide additional information about what happens in those meetings and what is the all the different kind of indicators that we collect one of the things and finally i will say is we are trying to create internally and we have been working in with partners in academia for a bit to create a strong sentiment meter of what the community perceives this kind of surveys then very openly tell us what people think and how that connects, as I said to you before, with perceptions of crime. So for instance, we want to know whether people are aware of social support. We want to know whether they are perceived the government to be competent. They want to know whether they perceive levels of social cohesion, their willingness to engage in, with government and some sort of perception that thinks the government is acting in an efficient way. These are all things that we do during those neighborhood stats. And again, some evaluations have indicated, for instance, that crime has declined and is correlated with more positive perceptions than residents have about their capacities, their abilities, the community conditions, and their ability to, to have a government that is responsive to their needs. MAP is all about that. And neighborhood stats meetings are all about bringing, making the resident the centerpiece of government action. Were you able to meet at all during the pandemic? For me? Were you able to meet at all during the pandemic? Uh, my understanding is that we have been much more limited in that. I will confirm. I don't want to provide. Uh, I, I believe we did, a, as you know, a summit, but I am not sure whether or not we were able to meet regularly during the pandemic. I'll get the answer to your question, and I'll ask you that question right away, and I'll provide your answer. Dr. Solo, we did have a neighborhood stat, so we, we are a participating agency. That, so the one was one uh, conducted just recently. I'm going to say within the last month, sir. So. Sorry, I, I am being confirmed that yes, we were able to meet during the pandemic. My team has confirmed that. Okay, okay, okay. The, the meetings were virtual, and we all know that a virtual meeting as, as this hearing, you know, that's as you know, that's not connect people in the same way. And we, and a program which is about connecting people, certainly we, we prefer not to have virtual meetings, but a virtual meetings are still better than no meetings. We provided also the residents with the technology to participate, which as you know, is essential. One of the elements here is, is that we just need to make sure that people a, can participate in and approach government. And oftentimes that's a big problem. And we don't we do not have the tools to make sure that residents get us all the feedback, and the pandemic has has exacerbated uh, that problem. 
Um, so going back to the question that I alluded to um, when I started the MAP discussion, um, critics of MAP would argue that crime can occur at a development across the street from a MAP site and not get the same attention, money, or resources. Um, have the neighborhood stat groups identified this as an emerging issue? And would they be able to use any resources from MAP to address that particular problem? So my question is, have, like, has this come up during an actual neighborhood stat meeting and conversation and during a pandemic, you know, where the, the, you know, where there are issues that came up around, this is what we should be doing around like gang violence and the increase in shootings, because there are so many young people that, you know, attend those meetings in particular in Brownsville houses and, and Van Dyke. So uh, what I can tell you is one thing for sure. This is an issue that we are aware of. This issue of the displacement of crime, as I mentioned before, is not something new. I, my, we are strongly concerned about that, particularly, as you said, particularly with regards to connection to the youth, which is why I stated before, my view is that we need a greater level of integration between the work that we do in those neighborhoods and a, sorry, in the map sites with the work that we do in CMS sites. As you know, we have right now 15 sites, CMA, a map. We have 29 sites in CMS. And what we see often is they are connected. So they are not, MAP is in one place, but Woodson has actually a CMS group working there. So how to figure out better ways to integrate. That's a challenge for us. We want to do better. This is why we have create, we have organized this around the Office of Neighborhood Safety. We know that's an area where we can do better a, and try to have bigger, a greater levels of synergy between our teams and figure out better ways, again, without losing the specificity of the two different offices, the MAP office and the Office of Super Ring Gun Violence, ways to listen better to what the concerns are of the, of the neighborhoods. And ultimately to bring that to the attention of the police department, a, which is the one partner who can help us in some instances when that happens, a, to increase enforcement, et cetera, I think that is absolutely important. We can, you know, uh, we, we can never exclude the need. We are concerned, obviously, about over enforcement, but we are equally concerned about dynamics of under enforcement that ultimately uh, might lead to uh, big problems in our particular community. Have you seen a drop at all in youth participation? Uh, I, I will, I think that some of the numbers that I saw indicate yes, some. Um, uh, and drop in youth participation. I saw, for instance, on the numbers in, so it's not fully, but for instance, in the numbers regarding the participation in the summer youth employment, a, the numbers were, I believe, higher. I will confirm the second number. Um, I believe, however, in other areas, we might have seen some decrease in youth. So, a, for instance, a specifically, a MAP achieved the highest number of summer youth employment placement levels of all NYSHA developments. A, we have a more than 23 uh, uh, C, uh, summer youth employment applicants, more than 14,000 enrollees. A, during the summer of 2020, a, we saw about 1,800, that, that was for the entire program. We saw about 1,832 youth enroll in the program. I will confirm whether or not that was a decrease with regards to the previous year, but certainly we have that's an area where we know, again, we need to uh, do better work and try to figure out ways to increase. A, we, a, there are some limitations. There are less employment opportunities, as you know. There are less opportunities for connection. And I will provide to your office a much more robust an answer, not just about the summer youth employment, but also across other strategies. For instance, our work with the Police Athletic League and the partnership that we do there Right, what we have seen fewer. We will also see, for instance, I will try to get you with regards to the community centers. As you know, we fund the expansion of hours of community, uh, community centers, et cetera. I, I will get you the numbers and where were the number of people who were able to attend or not to attend to community centers. So question, um, how much do you think is the gap right now on the amount of funding we need to have the necessary crime prevention programs 
and all of the correct surveillance strategies we need to be more effective in reducing crime in NYCHA. Is there a number that you can put to it based on what you've been seeing? I'm sorry, I, I, I cannot put a number for you. What I can tell you is what I mentioned before. Uh, I think the, the, the administration announcement of the joint task or the joint force to end gun violence and the doubling certainly of the CMS work side is a continual commitment of the administration to fight and to deal directly with the issue of a gun violence as the top priority along obviously fighting COVID. So I do not have, I want to see obviously how those programs work before telling you I see a gap. What I can tell you is, a, and this is very, again, beginning of the year, what I can tell you is that some of the dynamics that we start to see in New York City are very different than what we saw last year and certainly very different from what we saw, not what we are seeing national, nationwide. And so my expectations is that I will be, we will be able to give you a much greater, you know, a much accurate assessment of your question once we see how these programs that we are launching work and certainly how, you know, the dynamics that we are seeing on the ground right now, in, including the fact that, for instance, gun enforcement has increased by almost 100% in the last uh, six months, ultimately result in how we need to adjust our strategies. But I, unfortunately, I could not come up right now with a number, but I promise that I will connect with your office and follow up with you to try to better address your question. Okay, that would be helpful because as we are going through the budget process now, and you know, of course, I'm not talking about capital, just looking at um, operational yep. dollars and um, being able to, to fund um, programmatic initiatives, it would be really good to know what it is that we are um, fighting for and advocating for. You know, so sure. we can't talk about the question of expansion without knowing you know, what it is um, happening in place now and what's the need now. Yeah. And I, I understand fully what I mean is I don't want to give here a number. Then if I want this to be a well thought process, I hope you understand that at the deliberative process. That. And I, not to come up with a number in which later I would have to say, I'm sorry, I apologize, hey, I misspoke. Okay. So, so certainly commitment is to follow up with your office to make sure that we give you that number. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and just tracking time, I'm just gonna um, blow through the rest of our questions. Yes. Um, because I know we have other residents that chimed in late and uh, would like to testify. Um, so are all NYCHA developments currently staffed with a security guard, senior development buildings or other development buildings that are not? The used? only, thank you for that question, ma'am. The only uh, developments that are staffed with security guards are the senior citizens. We have 38 senior citizen developments and nine senior citizen uh, buildings that are dedicated to that. We have a population of 67,000 plus um, seniors and we provide security for an eight hour period, uh, normally during a busy time or a time that was designated by the residents and the management on when they need, they think the security guard is needed. So when would that be? Like, can you give us, so each development has a different Oh. Yes, we've. Uh, I normally it's like a late tour. It could be at eight to four in the morning or twelve to eight in the morning. But I had a development, a senior citizens building. I forget the name, but someplace in Bed Stuy, where they said they have a lot of activity during the day, and they would like their security guard to be changed uh, to work. Uh, I think a, a nine to five or a ten to six, and I granted that. And how many security guards per building? Only one per building. So, um, so one security guard per building um, for eight hour shift. So um, when they have to leave, who, who steps in? No one replaces them. They're only there for that eight hour period and you try to make a determination when is the best, what is the best eight hour period during the 24 hours that they would be there, ma'am. Uh, then, then there's no replacement. Except for, you know, at Woodson, where we, uh, unfortunately, since that tragic and our heart goes out, uh, we provided 24-7. So, 
So because of that tragedy and um, seeing an increase in crime across the city, is there a plan at all to increase um, security to 24 hours at all senior building? Um, I don't, excellent question, ma'am, but I know I wouldn't have the budget for that. Our budget that we have right now would not cover for 24-7 uh, on security guards at all those, uh, those buildings, ma'am. And are the security guards connected at all um, with NYPD in any sense? Are, do they have access to cameras? Is there a monitor at the desk in any of the buildings so that they can monitor the cameras while they are? Um... That's an excellent question. I would have to get back to you because each senior citizen development is somewhat different, especially those that are standalone within a development. I'm not sure. Some of, most of them are just in the lobbies for when per, someone comes in, they assign them in. If there's an issue, they're the first one to dial 911. They check in with our security base at, uh, at NYCHA uh, on different issues. So I don't want to say that they're not monitoring cameras. I would have to look at that, get back to you on that, ma'am. Okay, all right. Um, and, I, and I can say that I was, um, someone sent me a video of security in one of our NYCHA developments, one of our senior buildings, and the security guard was asleep and they had to, you know, like shock him for, and he was startled and, and woke up. When we get and, calls like, we get calls like that, ma'am, it happens. We get calls like that. Immediately we notify our contractor that we no longer want the services of this particular individual and we have it, we, we have them removed. Okay. All right. And so I just have a few more questions. Um, and this is, for the record, I need to ask them. Um, we touched on it, but we wanted to get a concrete answer. Um, what percentage of NYCHA buildings have doors that lock on the main entrances of the buildings? I, I think I answered that, ma'am. All of our uh, buildings uh, have locks on them. Um, it's not like it's, it, it's an open campus that you can just walk in without uh, using a doorway to come in. Okay, and so of all the doors that have a lock, how many of them um, have a broken lock right now? Uh, we have 5,600 uh, work orders out right now for doors. But that sounds like a lot, but it can be, as, it can be for a missing doorknob, a broken pane, a door that's ajar and it won't close properly. It doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that all those doors are actually not functional. But that's, what the, that's the amount of work orders that we have at this time now. Okay, and what can be done to reduce incidences of um, block vandalism and individual residents forcing doors open as well as the FDNY? And I know that Stephen- <laughs> The FDNY, I'll- uh, thank you for that question. I'll tackle that one first, uh, especially for our key fobs, because those are the doors that cost the most money. Whenever key fobs are, are done and uh, uh, our layered access is done and we issue key fobs to uh, all of our residents that live there, also the local precinct and the NCOs and also the fire department, we have to maintain and make sure that it was used properly. Unfortunately, sometimes in the fire department, when there's an uh, overturn in, in personnel at a firehouse, uh, you know, the firemen, if there's an emergency, they're going to take the door. Uh, I've had several meetings up in the polo grounds on that with a battalion chief, myself, uh, um, uh, to discuss it, and the condition is corrected until it happens again a little while later. Uh, as far as the uh, doors being jimmy, the doors being have tapes over the magnetic, uh, the doors having stones put in so you can't shut them properly. That's something that we have to work very closely with our resident heads, our resident president, for the, for the residents within NYCHA to take ownership and realize that the doors should be shut behind them and not jimmied so that the doors will be left open. Um, we see a lot of that. I can tell you times that me and Sholo or me and Vito have did tours and the first thing we're doing in the building is re ripping a tape off the magna magnets so the door will stay open. And by the time we come back downstairs, the door is jimmied again. 
That's an issue that we'll have to work closely with our residents to take ownership within their developments for these type of things to stop, this type of behavior to stop. Madam. Wait, wait, one second, uh, Stephen, before you go <clears throat> um, your, your spiel. So um, I have a development, R.D. Brown, um, where their lock has been broken for a year. And we've been going back and forth about this for a year. And the battle has been, there's only one lock vendor um, who was not able to cut keys and NYCHA knows all about this. And because of that, the residents don't have keys. And there's a struggle with the door being closed and then the door being open because no one has keys. And there's a battle of the blame between the intercom vendor and Verizon because there's a, a problem with the, the door lock itself and the key and then the intercom also not working in this senior development. And this has been a battle for the past year. And I know my office have, you know, we've just, we just help it. I know council member Adams talked about feeling helpless. We've this just been ridiculous. So. Um, I, I would, I would defer to my part, uh, my partner in that Steve, because he has some issues that pertain specifically to doors and try to remedy these yeah. problems. Steve, yeah. if you may please. And uh, thank you very much, Chief Nelson. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. I will be very brief on this because I, I know I'm long-winded um, and we can, we can brief the, 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 the group on this uh, outside of this. But um, you know, back in 2019, we had this exact same conversation and you know, touring the, the developments, speaking with our leaders, uh, speaking with the residents, um, we recognize, and I think everyone can recognize this, the doors are outdated. They, um, you know, the design standards of those are back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. They're heavy, they're expensive, and they're even more expensive to repair. And so we've created um, a pilot program, which we've been working with the CCOP, uh, who generously um, uh, nominated a number of residents to be part of a resident group that we started from the very, very beginning and inception of this program. And we're moving it through. Uh, this summer, we're going to be installing the pilot program at three developments. And this is about creating um, a new entry standard that's easily replaceable due to the standard parts being available and easy to purchase. And so that way, a lock breaks. You don't have to worry about the two or three vendors that, that can do this. A frame breaks or a, a, another piece of the hardware breaks. We can go out and get those parts and they can be accessible and, and less expensive to install. We recognize there's gonna be vandalism. We recognize that they're gonna get damaged, but we wanna make sure that there, uh, there's an industry standard there that we don't have to go out to one or two manufacturers to get this. Um, and then the cool part to this is it's not one size fits all. We recognize that there are different developments that have different needs. A, a, a senior building that might be a low rise only has a handful of individuals that are going in and out of that door. The door is seeing less usage than a family building. That might be a high rise, lots of usage of people going in and out. Getting back to the intercom and, and the layered access control, um, Greg and I have been out there um, and we've been looking at this. And one of the, one of the uh, examples that we're gonna have built out is the ability to get away from the hard line wiring, that argument between the uh, the telephone company and the intercom company, as you've said, that we get stuck in the middle of. And so maybe we can do wireless. It's, it's already in the system that we have. Um, not only does it do wireless, but then you can actually see the person on your phone. So when you're buzzed in that intercom, uh, you can identify that person and say, yes, I know who that delivery person is or that friend or that uh, acquaintance, they can come in or no, I don't know who this person is and I'm not gonna allow them or buzz them in. I think that's gonna slow down or, or you know, the fact is it, it's gonna stop the putting the tape on the locks and, and hopefully um, making the, the entrances more secure. So anyway, we put the funding together for that and really that comes out of the conversations at, with this committee. And um, this summer, we're gonna be installing the three. 
Uh, we have the stakeholder engagement as well as the resident group that's gonna be participating. And we would love to have as many council members out there to look at the, the door and uh, the doors, the intercoms and layered access to make sure that, that we're doing what, what's best for the residents, um, what's best for the taxpayers and, and really creating a new secure system. Thank you, I appreciate that, um, especially with making sure that you are working directly with um, the resident leaders in order to come up with the best way forward. So I, I um, that's, that's helpful and that's a helpful um, solution. Um, so I, I'm scrolling through my questions. I think that is it everyone for my questions. And I wanna make sure that there are no longer questions. We're gonna we're gonna go back to you, Mr. Farley. <laughs> I know you're ready. Um, I want to make sure there are no other questions from my colleagues. That's it for me, Audrey, with my um, questions for the administration at this time. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sure I'm appreciative. Thank Thanks. you so much, everyone. Um, I'm sure you're going to continue to stay logged in to listen to the residents and the um, public. But I, I, I do um, thank you for your testimony. And I do look forward to um, to working with you and partnering with you to make sure that um, our developments are safe. And um, Chief Barrera, I look forward to walking through NYCHA um, with you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. And Audrey, can you just give me one minute? Sure. I'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for your patience. Uh, in the meantime, um, just so that members of the public who are uh, planning to testify uh, are prepared, uh, we will first hear from Beverly McFarlane, followed by Carmen Canones. Okay, I'm back. Welcome back. Uh, we will now receive testimony from Beverly McFarlane, followed by Carmen Canones. Starting time. 
Am I unmuted? Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and I also would like to thank Diane Ayala for um, giving our, our re resident leaders the information about today's meeting. We had no not knowledge of today's meeting. So um, thank, I thank her for giving us that information in the Public Advocate Office also. Um, and I'm the resident association, well, a resident council president for TAP Houses, um, East Harlem. And in, we are under the local 11 scaffolding. Um, and since then, we have had an uptake in crime um, in the last two months, actually. We had one in the same building, same apartment. Um, we had two homicides in that same apartment. Um, and the apartment is still open um, it's from drug relating um, incidents. We have shootings between my development and King Towers and we have shootings on the, um, in TAF. We had a uh, uh, latest is a molestation of an eight year old and um, is uptake in homelessness in all the buildings and graffiti. I don't know if it's um, gang related graffiti but it just seems like a real uptake in the graffiti. So um, I heard y'all talk about the MAP program uh, and we are gonna be affected being tapped. So the MAP program is giving lighting to Johnson and Jefferson, which is right directly across the street from one block, one block away from Johnson. So when they get their lighting, I believe we're gonna have issues over here. Um, and then King is right next to us. So we have five block radius of housing developments here Time in this column that will be affected. Um, so I believe that we do need the lighting, lighting and the, the scaffolding is um, blocking the, the cameras. Uh, and we just, it's, we here at TAF, it's, I don't know. We don't have anything for any, any any safety and security. This is the first time I'm even hearing that NYCHA had a safety and security department that we can speak to because no one reached out to me as a resident leader in terms of um, all the things that are happening in TAF. So if I'm not calling my council members, uh, we, you know, it's like our voices are not heard. And we try to sit with the resident management um, and it just seems like it's falling on deaf ears. I had to reach out to PSA 5 in order for them to forward these police reports to housing in order to get some of these things done because Knight just saying that they can't obtain the, um, the reports and, and then uh, PSA 5 is saying they can't give the reports. So we're, we're, what are we left to do? Um, so we want to make sure that you know, this is quality of life issues that's going on and it's affecting all the developments. You know, we have so many, um, uh, and, and here in TAF, I have nine buildings, over 1,500 residents. We don't have a basketball court or we don't have a community center. So uh, where are our children to go? What are our children going to do? And you know, everything is so territorial. Uh, my children from TAF can't go to King. They can't go to Johnson because everything is so territorial, but we have nothing here. And I have expressed that to leadership in NYCHA and, and if I have fell on deaf ears, I have reached out to, um, you know, Diane Ayala have been doing the best she can, but she can't build a, a basketball court in the community center. Robert Rodriguez, I, I reach out to all my city um, council presidents, I mean, my city, officials, local officials, and to no avail. So we are really in desperate need here in TAF houses for any, you know, I just want someone to advise moving forward, what are we to do as NYCHA residents? These doors don't, don't, the doors are not locked. We don't have, it's the same thing everyone else was saying. I don't want to repeat myself, but we are really in desperate need here at TAF, Senator Robert A. TAF houses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. McFarland. Um, I appreciate that. Now, before I ask the question, I'll wait. I know Ms. Keonis is on too, so. 
Thank you. We'll next hear from Carmen Canones, followed by Mike. First of all, good afternoon. Uh, I've been here all morning. I've heard everything. Uh, Alika Samuels, you know you rock. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a few issues that I really want to touch on, um, and it's that scaffolding. That scaffolding here in Douglas Houses, I'm telling you, we look like we're in a, we, we look like we're in jail. Uh, the lighting is kind of poor. Uh, we also have uh, our cameras are being, being hidden. Um, I've asked for them to be removed to no avail. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief uh, I have not I had the honor of meeting you, um, but um, I would love for you to come toward Douglas. You haven't been here yet. Uh, this is for uh, Chief Nelson. Um, I am working closely with the 24th Precinct um, and our PSA. I even got them all, made sure that they all have keys to every building. Uh, they also help me out. Uh, they volunteer. They bring in uh, our explorers because uh, I give out food uh, on Thursday. Um, the first, the second Thursday and the fourth Thursday, we give out 8,500 pounds of food. Um, and our precinct uh, is very involved with it. We still have though broken doors. Um, and again, I, I, you know, they fix the doors. Our red is the is the people that come in the buildings. Is the residents? They 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 just vandalize these doors. If we can get somehow to. Uh, get them to stop breaking these doors because that money could be used for something else. So I want to, you know, the same way I complain, I know I know a lot of what it is. But my biggest thing is the homelessness. The homelessness uh, is really rumping ragged, uh, running ragged, especially in our development. We are, and and again, a lot of the mental illness. We have tenants with mental illness. I have. A neighbor right down the hall, and the son—you could tell he's not right in the head—and he stands out there, waits for people to come out, um, you know, and he harasses them. And we have a lot of them in these buildings. Um, and I, 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 I've done complained to the management, um, and this was so much management can do because they are residents. We need to bring back the moderation committee where we used to um, we used to actually really you know see who was coming in our buildings and even welcome them into our buildings. But tenants need to be screened when they come in here. These people with mental illness need help. They need help, and uh, the people that live here are scared of them. So it's almost like a catch twenty two. You you're putting us. In, in danger when you um you know rent to these rent to, now I'm not saying they don't deserve to live anywhere but there's got to be some special uh, uh places where we can put uh, people with that type of mental illness that all they do is hang out in the street this is crazy you know a lot of our seniors are scared to come out and this is happening in all the buildings because we have at least one in every building that suffers from mental illness and stalks people. That has to be addressed. Um, as a, a tenant association president, I'm the president of Douglas Houses. Um, we do our part, but something has to give. And as far as Chief, you talked about uh, monitoring the, 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 the cameras, that's a lie. Man, ha let me tell you something, the management does not watch these cameras at all at all. Um, I believe that uh, our uh, precinct, the 24th precinct, which I love, uh, my PSA 6, I love them too, because they are always here. But we have to do a lot more. This scaffolding is dangerous. It has to go down. Nobody's doing anything with this scaffolding. Nothing. And they're telling me it's supposed to be up to 22. But they're not doing anything with it. They're just making money. That's all that's happening with the scaffolding. People making money. 
and our people are getting hurt. And 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 this is this is horrible. Something has to give. Chief, I wait for you to give me a call. My number is 347-499-0025. I would love for you to call me. I want you to tour with me, uh, please. Um, and um, anybody else that can come, Chief David uh, from NYPD, you're the chief for housing. I would love for you to come down too. Because in order for us to get this together, we got to work together. And I work very hard, very hard with my precinct, with my PSA, and with my management. And I've got a good team, but something else has to give. So I just wanted to make that clear. I want to applaud all of you guys for having this uh, safety meeting. Um, I really appreciate it. I've been on all night all day, and I will continue to be on. I'm not going to be repetitious, but we definitely have to do more. Um, because that doesn't only put us at risk, it does put our police officers at risk when you don't, when they come in a building and they don't know what to expect from someone with mental illness. So we have to work either on getting some uh, counselors here in every development. We need counselors, we need everything. So let's work on that because if we can clean up the inside, the outside will be a lot better. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Carmen. And I really hope that you, um, everyone was able to hear um, everything that was stated by Ms. Quiones and Ms. McFarland. And in particular, um, the homeless situation that we did not um, touch in detail um, during this hearing, um, as well as um, uh, discussions around resident watch and the team from engagement that or, or safety and security within NYCHA that go out and actually speak to the residents. I would hope that you have a direct conversation with Ms. McFarland um, from TAB Houses. Um, I was a little shocked when she said that there's been no meeting at all um, with her. So um, let's make sure that that happens. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that's that concludes the testimony from our residents, correct, Audrey? I, I believe so, although we do have a few more members of the public. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that there were no other residents that were not able to testify. Uh, I don't currently see them on okay. uh, on the Zoom meeting, but we will do an open call at the end in case okay. we miss anyone. Um, so next we will hear from Maya Cole, followed by Andre Ward. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Maya Cole and I'm a Skadden Fellow with the Civil Justice Practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to thank the Committee on Public Housing and Chair Amprey Samuel for the opportunity to testify today. The focus of this hearing is on public safety at NYCHA, and I urge the Council to think broadly about what public safety means. It must include investment in communities rather than investment in policing. Evidence shows that NYCHA residents and their communities are not made safer by an increased police presence. Kids in particular are stopped and harassed almost daily by the police, but when they are victims of violence, the police do not protect them. One of our clients, Ms. R, is a lifelong resident of a MAP development. Recently, she has seen more police at her development. They frequently antagonize her young son and his friends and bring them to the precinct for questioning. Ms. R feels that she and her son are less safe precisely because there are more police. Poor lighting, ever-present scaffolding, and a persistent rat problem also make Ms. R feel unsafe in her home. As part of the harassment by law enforcement that NYCHA residents face, Police officers regularly question residents' uh, residents' right to be in their own buildings, to hang out with their friends, and to visit their families. They do this with the trespass list. Anyone with a felony drug sale arrest on NYCHA property is put on this list and can be arrested for being on NYCHA grounds, even if they're a resident. NYCHA also aggressively pursues termination of tenancy proceedings against residents who allegedly engage in non-desirable behavior. Once NYCHA learns about an arrest on its property, they rush forward with a termination proceeding, often based on minor infractions or criminal charges that are ultimately dropped. NYCHA must invest in its communities to promote its residents' self, safety and well-being. This includes improving the physical structure of NYCHA developments, maintaining publicly run community centers at NYCHA, and revitalizing youth employment programs. NYCHA should invest in alternatives to policing and criminalization so that tenancy terminations are their absolute last resort. 
And finally, NYCHA should expand its family reentry program so that more people coming out of incarceration can be reunited with their families. Part. Thank you for considering these issues. Thank you. We will now hear from Andre Ward, followed by Judith Smith. Starting time. Yes, good afternoon. Um, Chair Afri Samuels, we thank you for convening this and for all of the city council members that have joined this um, committee meeting and hearing, we really appreciate that. Um, my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President for the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Fortune has been around over 53 years um, as an organization that supports su successful reentry from incarceration and promotes alternatives to incarceration that strengthen in the fabric of our communities. And we do this by believing in the power of people to change, building lives of those um, who have been impacted by the criminal legal system. And we ultimately are involved in changing minds through education and advocacy to promote the creation of fair, humane, and truly rehabilitative correctional system. And you know, before I go on, I just want to really acknowledge those um, folk who spoke before us as tenants whose family members' lives have been taken um, and ultimately have been harmed in some way. I really want to acknowledge that. And I know that you know the committee's focus here today is to talk about public safety within the New York City Housing Association's developments, including the progress of the Mayor's Action Plan, um, for which many have spoken about already. And the plan obviously includes focusing on reducing crime and 15 public housing developments, um, et cetera. You know, I'm a former incarcerated Black man who spent at least 19 years of my life living in New York City public housing, specifically in the East New York section of Brooklyn and Lewis H. Pink houses, where my mom resided for over 32 years and also had been robbed there. So I understand as someone who has been involved in harming, but also being some, have a family member who's impacted by people's actions in NYCHA. And I'm very, very aware of those things. However, you know, because of the pandemic, because of the MAP initiatives, right, we know that a lot of things is happening and we cannot use the increased violence that's occurring as a rationale for keeping NYCHA's permanent exclusion regulations in place. You know, there's folk from academia, experts, criminologists, who've talked about, you know, the idea of, the increase of crime due to COVID-19. And that's something that we really, really have to address. In other words, it appears that the MAP has been not doing a really effective job. And therefore, like the council, I'm really urging the council, and we're urging the council that NYCHA not use the temporary surge of violence in housing as a reason to support the continued use of exclusion of tenants because of their criminal record. But NYCHA currently mandates um, blanket denial for admissions to anyone with misdemeanors, et cetera, as, as someone who spoke about me before mentioned. And so it makes it very difficult for people to access housing. In fact, while permanent exclusion jeopardizes the housing stability of family members whose loved ones visit with them or stay with them illegal, legally, it often does not keep such people, obviously, um, or visits from actually happening. And so there's a need to really work on those things. It was mentioned about the pilot program. Um, the family reunion program that I know, uh, Madam Chair, you're familiar with. And you know, it's designed to support people with those housing initiatives and to make sure that people aren't permanently excluded but given the opportunity to reunite with their families. But not only is permanent exclusion unjust, it may even be dangerous. The lack of housing affects the ability of the formerly incarcerated to successfully take on almost any other essential reentry task such as employment or drug rehabilitation, rising, raising their potential rates of recidivism in the process. And so, you know, this idea of making people, making sure people aren't excluded by NYCHA is really, really important. And the pandemic has to end, MAP needs to do its job, and permanent exclusion must, must also be removed. It is only at that point that we can truly and effectively analyze the data on violence in public housing that the city provides. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and others for listening to this, what I just shared. Thank you so much, Mr. Ward. And I, I really do appreciate you, the work that you do and your advocacy. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear testimony from Judith Smith followed by Wendy Lorenzetti Olivo. Starting time.
Uh, Ms. Smith, I believe you're still muted. Okay, one moment. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding public safety in NYCHA. My name is Judith Smith. I am a resident of Douglas Houses. I am also a member of We Act for Environmental Justice and Healthy Homes Working Group, and together we are fighting for healthy housing in NYCHA. I am testifying today in support of increasing efforts to address the public safety conditions in NYCHA, building maintenance to improve health issues like mold, lead, clean water is key. However, building maintenance is also key to improving public safety in NYCHA. In my experience, the intercoms are constantly being broken. The entrance um, door is not locked as needed. Not all NYCHA buildings have cameras, and the ones that do, they are not monitored. Um, and um, from my experience, over 15 years ago, I was mugged and almost raped in my building because of the, the locks, the entrance door not working. And that was over 15 years ago. And the same situation is still here. It hasn't changed. By ensuring the safety and accountability within the residential environment, there will be more opportunity for NYCHA and NYPD to posit positively influence interaction between them and the residents. Therefore, home environments will be safer, preventing and reducing the healthy effects of chronic stress and preserving environmental health. It is important to act fast to address the public crisis in NYCHA because we public housing residents deserve to live safe and in and, and, and healthy homes. NYCHA is an asset to our city. Our population amounts to 600,000 people. That is larger than um, some cities around the world. For too long, we have pushed aside, um, NYCHA has pushed aside our health and well being. They have ignored um, our health and well being, has, and our health and well being has been ignored. And now, with the additional crisis of COVID, we are dealing with even greater social, economic, and political impact. The environment and systematic mismanagement and neglect that has led NYCHA to despair must be brought up to justice and addressed now. And um, what I would like to say is I keep hearing about NYCHA needing more money. Um, I remember maybe back in 2005, there was a hearing in Washington about not give, giving NYCHA more money because of the mismanagement of what they had. So I don't understand this call for more money and they're not, we don't even know how they're spending what they have. I can tell you as a resident, there is a lot of waste of money, okay? So I believe that NYCHA needs to be audited, their books open to find out how this money is being spent, how they are handling what they have before we advocate for more money, because this is not money that's growing off a tree. Every time you advocate for more money, my taxes go up. So this is taxpayers' money you're talking about. And I think they should be made accountable for how they are using this money. It's a lot of waste with the contractors, the scaffolding, a lot of mismanagement going on, and that needs to be addressed also. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Smith. 
I really do appreciate your testimony and I do apologize. Um, uh, you were listed under your organization of WE Act and so we didn't realize that you were a resident. So, but thank you. Thank you. We will now receive testimony from Wendy Lorenzetti Olivo. Starting time. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding public safety in NIGHTA. My name is Wendy Lorenzetti Olivo and I'm a bilingual community organizer at We Act for Environmental Justice. I organize with NYCHA residents to work in our Healthy Homes Working Group. I'm here to discuss important public safety considerations for residents in their developments. I have worked with NYCHA residents for almost a decade, more closely in the past three years with residents in the Polo Grounds, Wrangell Houses, and Harlem River Houses. In my experience, there was little to no public safety. The doors were constantly broken and were left so that anyone could walk into any building. Stairways and common areas have also been areas of concern as far as public safety. In working with residents at WEACT, they have stated that they believe that all NYCHA buildings should have a security unit with adequate resources, including fully functioning surveillance devices to maintain security for residents, including intercoms and cameras. We want residents to feel safer and be safer, understanding that preventing or reducing the health effects of chronic stress will contribute to an improvement on quality of life for residents. With existing issues like lead, mold, and other indoor environmental health problems, residents should not have to deal with feeling and being unsafe in and around their own homes. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I, thank you. Thank you. This concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will try to hear from you now. Uh, seeing that there uh, is nobody that has yet to testify, I will now turn it over to Chair Ampri Samuel to close the hearing. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone who came out and testified today. I really do appreciate your stories and your willingness to share. And I really do hope that NYPD and NYCHA and um, MOCJ all heard the concerns of our residents and will continue to work to make sure that um, our families who deserve a decent and, and, and healthy and safe home um, receive just that. Um, I want to just say I appreciate everyone for staying on. Um, I appreciate you, Chief um, Nelson. I appreciate you, Chief Ferrer um, and Mark J. I, I, I really do. And I hope that this is a sign that we will make sure that we are working together um, to provide the, the security and safety measures that every single resident need. Um, I want to also thank um, our Public Housing Committee. Thank you so much, Audrey, for everything. Thank you, Ricky. Um, thank you, Jose. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, everyone. I also want to um, just thank my staff for their help as well. Um, and with that, this will conclude today's hearing on public safety at NYCHA.